Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Miss Rosalind Russell in Louis Brumfield's Mrs. Parkington on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we are delighted to present a dramatization of a well-known story by one of America's best and most popular writers, Louis Brumfield. Mr. Brumfield, who won the Pulitzer Prize for one of his novels, is many things besides a writer. He's widely traveled. I remember I first met him at a party in London. And he's also a farmer whose land in Ohio has become famous not only because of the books he has written about it, but because of the excellence of its methods and produce. A good writer and a good farmer. Quite a combination, that. The story of Mr. Brumfield that we have chosen for tonight is Mrs. Parkington. And we're especially privileged to have starring in it one of Hollywood's most famous actresses, Rosalind Russell. But before we raise the curtain, here is Frank Goss, who has a brief message from Hallmark. For a Christmas greeting your friends will long remember, make your selections now from the complete Hallmark collection on display at the friendly store where you buy Hallmark cards. Whatever your taste, whatever your budget, you'll take special pride in sending Hallmark cards. And on the back of every one is the identifying Hallmark that says, you cared enough to send the very best. Hallmark Playhouse, starring Rosalind Russell in Louis Brumfield, Mrs. Parkington. No matter how many years your face records, the past where you are always young is only a memory away. Leaping Rock, Nevada is 67 years back into time for me. But I have only to close my eyes to be that age again, to live those hours over. I have only to close my eyes to see my mother shutting the kitchen door and leaning wearily against it. I have only to close my eyes to see Major Parkinson, our star boarder from New York, coming in the kitchen door. He had on a silk shirt and a purple cravat and a checkered waistcoat and a diamond pin and a diamond ring and a gold watch and chain. He'd sit there straddling a chair while we cooked dinner. I tell you, you'll love New York, Susie. It's color, noise, excitement, adventure. It's the Arabian Nights, it's poetry, it's music, it's Delmonico's. It's dancing, it's laughter, it's enchantment. The city for the young, Susie. A challenging, fabulous city that belongs to anyone who can conquer it. Was it the moment when I sat in the kitchen telling him about New York and he told me about it when I fell in love with him? That moment, he was a child. Was it in that dark hour after my mother and father died in a mine explosion? When he tried to shut out all pain of loss and death, but I first loved him. That hour he was a father. Or did I wait to fall completely in love that snowy wedding night when he carried me across the threshold of the Brevoort Hotel? That evening, he was a husband. Are you happy, Susie? Oh, Gus, it is like the Arabian Nights. Red velvet curtains and white roses and candlelight. No, Susie, you're so young and so lovely. I wake to a memory of music and soft falling snow. Across the room, I saw my husband eyeing me over a coffee cup. Get up and have some breakfast, sleepyhead. I certainly will. How did that breakfast get in here without waking me up? Came by magic. I waved my hand. There it was. <laughs> oh, I'm so hungry. Here, have some coffee. I sent a note to a friend of mine asking her to come and take you on a shopping expedition today. Huh? Uh-huh. Aspasia County. She's a French woman who knows more about everything than any woman has a right to know about anything. <laughs> She'll help you in a lot of ways. Help me? Susie, darling. I'm a very rich man, but while money can buy a lot, it can't buy everything. New York is a tough place. We'll have to fight for what we want. I've always had to fight. I don't mind for myself. 
I want to make it easy for you. Well, that must be Aspasia. Hello, Gus, darling. Susie, this is Mademoiselle Conte. Mademoiselle, this is my wife. I'm very happy to know you, Mademoiselle Conte. It is a pleasure to meet the wife of my very good friend, Major Parkington. She is much more beautiful than you deserve, Gus. I want you to take her out and buy her the most fashionable things in the city. Because tonight I'm going to show Susie New York. And I'm going to show New York Mrs. Parkington. And it was all he said it would be. Music and laughter, poetry and waltzing. Winter melted into spring, and my life was at its springtime too. And when I learned that I was going to have a child, it seemed to me I had reached the fullest happiness that can come to any woman. I began to wish then that we could leave the hotel and find a small cottage somewhere outside the city. I told Gus. And that afternoon, he drove Aspasia and me down to 34th Street. Here we are, Susie. Nope, oh, careful now. <laughs> I'm all right, Gus. Well, I don't believe I know anyone at this address. Uh, what is it? A hotel? How does it strike you as a cottage? A cottage? Oh, it strikes me as being just about what would strike you as being a cottage. I'm not so sure about Susie. I bought this today as a surprise for you, Susie. You may not believe it, but this house has 30 rooms. 30 rooms for two people? Well, don't forget there's going to be three of us pretty soon. Well, even so, we don't need ten rooms apiece. Here, look at this door. Solid mahogany. Oh. Eleven, what a hall! I've never seen such chandeliers. Oh, gosh, the gas bills are going to be ferocious. <laughs> <laughs> See that staircase? Marble, every inch of it. You like it, Susie? Like it? Oh, gosh, it's a palace. I knew you'd love it. Come on, let me show you the rest of it. Here's the ballroom. Oh, oh what a room for a party! And I'm giving a party in three weeks. I'm going to have the cream of New York society. Oh, it's time we launched ourselves. We've got the house, we've got the money. Miss Bézier, you can help me with a guest list. And Susie, you'll stand right there by that window in a white satin gown. There'll be flowers everywhere and music playing and the best people in New York bowing before you. Three weeks later, I stood in that ballroom in my white satin with Gus and Aspasia facing an empty room. There was a Dresden shepherd and shepherdess on the mantel behind us. And suddenly Gus picked up the shepherd and hurled it across the empty ball. Gus! Oh, Gus, how could you? How could you? No, they didn't come. They'll pay for this, every last one of them. Gus, I, I feel a little dizzy. Get her up to bed, Gus. The evening is bad enough for her without her shouting and carrying on like that. It doesn't matter, Gus. It doesn't matter that no one came. I'm just so tired. You had better carry her upstairs. No, no, I'll be all right. I'll, I'll be all... Oh. Susie, Susie. Carry her upstairs to bed. I will send one of the men for the doctor. Gus. I'm here, darling. I'm so tired, Gus. I know. Why don't you go outdoors and walk? I'm all right, the... Doctor, I'll pay them back. If it takes every set I've got. If it hadn't been for those snobs, I might have had a son today. And you wouldn't be lying there with all that pain behind you and nothing to show for it. Gus, the doctor said it was because I fell. It would probably have happened regardless of the body. Dirty, rotten snobs. Susie, I swear to you, I'll pay every one of them back. <laughs> There was nothing I could say or anyone else could say that would ever change him. I forgot about the episode as the months and then the years went by. And Herbert and Ellie and Alice were born. And it wasn't until long ago, much later than that, that I found out that he'd been getting his revenge. That was an hour when I feared him and almost hated him. An hour when I met a completely new Major Parkington. Gus. Have you seen the newspaper? Prominent financier commits suicide. Radnor Beaumont dies. Yes, I saw it. He was one of the people you invited to the party, wasn't he? Yes. According to the papers, 
He was facing bankruptcy. It can be very dangerous to refuse an invitation to a party you give, can't it? Very. Good Hugh Blair's cousin was here. She begged me as a favor to... To ask you not to ruin her cousin. She said he would kill himself. Good Hugh Blair won't kill himself. He hasn't the guts. I'll try to explain it to you. Those same men would have ruined me just as ruthlessly. They were trying to do it. But they weren't strong enough. And I can tell you one thing. If they had, I wouldn't have hanged myself in a cupboard. I'd have gone back to work and made another fortune. He was an ambitious man. Ambitious for himself, ambitious for his wife, ambitious for his children. They went to the best schools, dressed like royalty and had everything money could buy. I tried to keep him from giving them too much, but he was determined they should have all the things that neither of us had in our childhood. And they certainly did. And so it happened when our daughter, Alice, was still too young to know what she wanted. She decided to marry a French duke. Aspasia, I know this marriage is wrong. Do you realize that Gus is settling $100,000 a year on a duke? I cannot sanction a marriage like that. Oh, you may be right, but it is too late for that. Oh, let her marry him, Susie. If she does not marry the Duke, it, it will be another like him. She is doomed. Why do you say that? It, it is the same with her brothers. Their father has implanted in them a sense of being possessed of some special privilege, of being outside the rules which govern the conduct of ordinary people. So Alice will marry, not for love, but for a title. And there is nothing you can do about it. Spacey. Oh, Spacey. I'm so afraid you're right. Would you like to send a personally imprinted Christmas card this Christmas? So unusual, your friends will show it to all who visit them during the holiday season? Then see the new Hallmark creations at the friendly store where you buy Hallmark cards. There are five distinctive types of Hallmark cards for imprinting with your name. Each designed as only Hallmark craftsmen can design them. There are Hallmark cards with beautiful designs and silken tapestries, richly engraved formal cards, and cards that speak a man's language with sporting scenes by Edwin McGargy, Lynn Bogue Hunt, Lasell Ripley. There's the Hallmark Blue Book with sophisticated designs and surprise features. And there's the Hallmark Gallery Artist Series. Open the Hallmark album at any page and what a treasure lies before you. Quaint winter scenes by Grandma Moses. Delightful Christmas scenes by Norman Rockwell. Here, too, you'll find Salvador Dali, Marcel Vertez, Cezanne, Renoir, Gauguin, Monet, Van Gogh. Yes, more than 50 foremost artists contribute their genius to the Hallmark Gallery Artist Collection. Personal Christmas cards on which you will be proud to have your name imprinted. Remember, these are Hallmark cards. When friends receive them and look on the back, as you did, they'll see the Hallmark and know you cared enough to send the very best. And now we continue with part two of Louis Brumfield's Mrs. Parkington, starring Rutherland Russell. my eyes to enter the past at random. Three years after Alice's marriage was a summer I shall always look back on as the most terrible summer of my life. My son Herbert was killed in June in an automobile accident, leaving a widow and two small children. And in August came a letter from Alice saying her marriage was unbearable and impossible, that she wanted a divorce. Aspasia and I left for Paris immediately. And when we arrived there, we learned that the Duke was contesting the divorce. This was obviously a move to extract blackmail money. So I decided to match the Duke at his own game. I hired detectives, got a complete file on the Duke's past and present activities, and then arranged a meeting. He was as charming as ever. Mrs. Partington, you're lovelier than even my memories of you. Thank you, Jacques. You needn't be flattering. This is hardly a friendly meeting. I understand that you have treated Alice abominably and that you have absented yourself from home for weeks at a time. It is all well quite true. But 
From the beginning, it was complete misery to live with her. Nothing is worth that. Jacques, understand this. There isn't going to be any more money. My husband was too generous to you in the first place. Last time you dealt with him. This time you deal with me. I have a dossier here on you that was compiled by six of the finest and possibly the most unscrupulous detectives in France. It is in complete order, ready to be released to the newspapers. You're very good at your game, Mrs. Parkington. For instance, do you know a Madame Lazare? It would be most foolish to say no. An expose of that little episode in your life would drag in the names of other important people. You need not continue. I'm forced to say that your investigators are remarkably good. My lawyer and yours will get together. I will not contest the divorce. Susie. Oh, Papa. Oh, I've missed you. Thank you. Papa, Hey, Legrand. Alice, darling. Papa, it's good to see you. I've arranged a wonderful summer for you. You'll soon forget all this business. Oh, it's so good to have my family home again. Gus, where's Eddie? Susie, let me tell you about that when we get home. Come on, the car's right over here. Eddie, dead. My son. My son dead. Don't, darling. There's nothing that can be done now. But to kill himself, why? Why? We don't know that he killed himself. It happened in Denver. The gun may have been discharged accidentally. Gus, I... I have to get out of this house. Susie. I have to go for a while. I can't bear this house. I can't bear to look at it, to be shut up in it. If I stay here... I'll die, too. Susie, I... I hate this house. I tell you, I hate this house. I hate the money. We're choking, smothering, strangling in money. Can't you see that? If it hadn't been for the money, Herbert wouldn't have had money to buy a car. Alice wouldn't have married that fortune hunter. Eddie wouldn't have had everything and been tired of it before he was 25. I hate the money, and I hate this house. I... wanted you and my children to have everything. I wanted to found a dynasty. Well, you founded your dynasty. I hope you're proud of it. I remember thinking I must surely die of grief and bitterness. But the heart has a way of reconciling itself and going on. Just as Gus had said New York was there to conquer or to be conquered, so it is with life. If you've red blood in your veins, you conquer life and go on. And only when you're long past the hours of trial do you discover that what you conquered each time was off your Knowing this, I was able to go on when the Major died. Susie, you have been wonderful. I know the funeral and all was a great trial to you. It was a great sorrow for you too, Estelia. I know that. Gus might have married you if it hadn't been for that explosion in the leaping rock. Oh, no, Susie. Gus Parkington was in love with youth. And I have been old from the hour of my birth, just as you have been young. Oh, he, he was a splendid man. He was a happy man. I think people are really happy in proportion to how much they give. He wasn't always a good man, but he gave a great deal. He gave a great deal more than he took from others. Leaping Rock is 67 years back into time. 67 years from the moment when the Major first told me about New York to the moment when my granddaughter's husband, Amory, walked into my sitting room on Christmas Eve. The whole family was gathered downstairs for a Christmas dinner, and I was just about to go down when he came in. Hello there, Granny. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Amory. I hate to bother you before the Christmas dinner, but it is rather important. How much do you need this time, Amory? $750,000. $750,000? Amory! That's the amount I've stolen. Stolen? I took funds I had access to that weren't mine to invest. I thought I had a sure thing and that I could put the money back. Oh, Amory, why? Why, Amory? You had plenty of money. You knew there was more, much more in the background. You only had to wait until I died. I wanted to make more money. I wanted to be successful. If I give you this money, will that stop the whole thing? I hope so. It's just a matter of putting it back now. And if I don't give it to you? 
I shall have to stand trial. Cook says dinner's ready, Mrs. Parkinson. She's getting cross about it. Come, Emily. Let's go down. I'll think this over and let you know my decision before you leave tonight. I sat at the dinner table looking around at the faces of Gus's and my descendants. And suddenly I knew, with a cold sense of defeat, that not one of those faces was a happy one. And I remembered Alice's face when she was young. And Herbert. And Eddie. And I knew that they had not been happy either. But Gus and I had been happy. And suddenly realizing that, I knew what I had to do. I think Grandmother's been looking wonderful, aren't you? Quiet, everybody. Quiet, please. Grandmother has the floor. A Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas to you. I think perhaps I had better say that first. Because I don't know how merry you're going to think it is when I finish. First of all, Amory is in trouble that calls for some financial assistance, which I am going to give him. Thank you, Granny. Thank you. I'm going to give it to him because I don't blame him for the trouble he is in any more than I blame the rest of you for being selfish and spoiled. Amory, like you, is a product of the things he had no control over, the era that preceded him. I think now he has learned a lesson. But something must be done about him and about you. So for all of you, when I die, a small trust fund will be set up, the income from which will pay your rent and food and very little else. If you want anything else, I very much hope you will go out and earn it. Well, of all the notes. Well, I hardly thought it would be pleasing but to you. Grandmother, the rest of the money. It's going back where it came from. You mean a memorial for the maiden? No, indeed. I'm not interested in creating a legend at this late date that Gus was a great man. Gus did a lot of good, but most of it was done accidentally. I stayed married to him all these years. Because he was a scamp on a gigantic scale. And because he was fascinating. And because I was in love with him right up to the end. I was kind of Gus's gun now when you come right down to it. No, the money is going to things like hospitals and settlements and libraries. And now let's get on with this party because tomorrow I am going on a trip and I want to be good and rested to go on it. Where are you going, Granny? I am going back to Leaping Rock, Nevada. <laughs> So I went back to finish the days in the land where I had begun them. And now I was content with the hot, sleepy slowness of the days. For I knew what lay beyond the mountains. What New York and most of the rest of the world was like. And I knew that here was what all the rest of the world was seeking. Simplicity and a sense of freedom and well-being and happiness of spirit. It had been there all the time, but it had taken me 67 years to find my way back to it. moment, James Hilton and Rosalind Russell will return. But first, may I invite you again to see the new Hallmark Christmas cards now on display at your friendly Hallmark dealers. If you prefer to select cards to individually fit each one on your list, you'll find the Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. There are Hallmark albums from which to select cards for imprinting with your name, and there are the many boxes of assorted Hallmark cards. Yes, whatever your taste, whatever your budget, there are Hallmark cards you'll take special pride in sending. And when your friends receive them and look on the back, as you did, they'll see the hallmark and know you cared enough to send the very best. Now here again is James Hilton. Miss Rosalind Russell, I want you to know how much we've enjoyed having you here with us tonight. For all of us here and for every member of the hallmark family, our grateful thanks for a great performance. 
I never know quite how to respond to introductions or words of appreciation. I guess like your hallmark greeting cards, the best practice is simply to say the appropriate and the sincere thing. So thank you. It was a great pleasure to be here. We shall inscribe your name on our roll of honored guests. And we invite you to listen next week when we shall present O'Halloran's Luck by Stephen Vincent Benet and starring Edmund O'Brien. Ladies and gentlemen, in the workshop behind our Hallmark Playhouse, it's Christmas. Oh no, we are not exchanging gifts yet. But we've been doing a lot of thinking about Christmas, about the Hallmark Christmas radio program. We've already made our selection, and I won't tell you what it is. I'm merely using it as an illustration of how far ahead we work. Long before you hear a story on the air, We've been through libraries and bookshelves, reading, making notes, and discussing dramatic possibilities. We try to select the kind of person the author had in mind when he created the character, and therefore we try to visualize the particular star who will fit the leading role. It's a long, careful process, but I'd rather think we've been successful if your comments are any gauge. We like to hear from you. As a matter of fact, I'd like to hear from you about stories you're especially fond of. It might help me and all of us in making the Hallmark shows your best entertainment. So, if you'd care to write to me, and I'd welcome that, just address James Hilton, care of Hallmark Playhouse, Columbia Broadcasting System, Hollywood, California. And now, until next Thursday, this is James Hilton saying good night. The right story was adapted for radio by Gene Holloway, with music composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, our director producer is Dee Engelbach. Rosalind Russell is currently starred in the independent artist production of Velvet Touch. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Stephen Vincent Benet's O'Halloran's Luck, starring Edmund O'Brien. In the following week, Claude Jarman Jr. in Mary O'Hara's My Friend Flicker. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, Autolite presents Rosalind Russell. Hello, Harlow. How is Mr. Autolite by Cornelius Wilcox's fine December evening? Well, by Cornelius, fit as a fiddle, Hap. Huh? How's yourself? All set for winter? Yep. Overcoat I... out of mothballs? Yep. I... Storm windows up? Snow shovel on the back porch? Well, I... Autolite stay full battery in your car? Harlow, you were... Try... You know, friend, when the bottom drops right out of the thermometer, you'll appreciate a dependable Autolite stay full battery more than ever. Why, everybody ought to switch to Autolite. For those Autolite Stay Full batteries are just loaded with extra features. First, they have an extra large liquid reserve. Need water only three times a year in normal car use? What an extra. And what's more? Here's the next Autolite Stay Full battery extra, Harlow. Suspense. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Miss Rosalind Russell in Anton Leder's production of The Sisters, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. one I think would be very lovely. It has a far superior lining, pure silk, much heavier than the others we've looked at. Uh, do you care for this one, Miss Haskell? Yes, that's very nice. But I believe I'd like to see something perhaps even a little better. Oh, of course. If you will just step over this way, Miss Haskell. Now, here, here is an exquisite casket. Something that really does honor to the departed. Yes, it's beautiful. Now, the interior is just the same as the last, but the casket itself is a bronze, solid bronze. Won't that be rather heavy? Oh, yes, but not too heavy. Uh, will there be six pallbearers? I don't know. Well, it doesn't matter, really. Four men can carry this very easily, very. Uh, Miss Haskell, I want you to notice the floral design here. All hand-wrought, every bit of it. And, uh, oh, oh, yes, uh, notice the seams in this casket. Airtight and watertight, uh, guaranteed. <clears throat> You know, of course, how important that is. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, but this casket, in a hundred years or even two hundred years, will be just as strong and will look just as beautiful as it does on this stand today. You couldn't buy a finer piece of workmanship. How much would this one be, please? Uh, this casket, uh, Duravo, by the way, Duravo for durability, we say in the trade. Uh, this casket is priced at uh, $775. <clears throat> we uh, can't bring back the departed. Our only solace is the knowledge that we have done them the last possible honor. Very well. I'll take this one. Oh, I'm sure you are making a very wise choice. In all my years as a mortician, I've never found a family that regretted money spent on a Duravo. Yes. <clears throat> now, uh, let me see. I'll uh, give you a check. Oh, oh, that won't be necessary. Not immediately. After the funeral will do. Oh, uh, by the way, we haven't mentioned it. Are, uh, <clears throat> are we handling the funeral arrangements? I don't know yet. Oh. Well, uh, you want the casket delivered uh, somewhere? No. I'd like you to hold it for a while, please. Hold it? Uh, but uh, for how long? For three weeks. Three weeks? I don't understand. Uh, who is the party, the uh, deceased? Uh, who is the casket for? It's for me. <laughs> you come in. Where have you been, Lydia? You've been gone all afternoon. I've been shopping. What did you buy? Did you get the ribbons I asked for? No, I didn't have time. Oh, I wanted some new ribbons. These are all worn out. See, Lydia? Uh, Ellie, I wish you'd stop putting ribbons in your hair like a schoolgirl. You're almost 40 years old. I know, Lydia. I know. Then try to act like it. Oh, hand me my sewing and light the lamp. It's getting dark. I wonder why we have to grow old. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had always stayed young like we used to be? Oh, Lydia. <laughs> Remember when Mother used to send us out to school with our ribbons matching and our dresses matching? And at the end of the day, no one would even guess we were sisters because I was always so mussed and you were always so clean. <laughs> oh, I wish we were young again, Lydia. Stop talking nonsense, Ellie. It is nonsense, isn't it? Oh, the doorbell rang while you were out. Just before you came home. You didn't answer us? Oh, no. You told me never to answer it. I just looked out of the upstairs window. Did you see who it was? Oh, yes, yes. It was a man. A rather big man. He rang a long time and then he went away. He didn't see you, did he? Oh, no. I just peeked ever so carefully from behind the curtains. Then I came down here and watched him going down the walk. You came downstairs? Yes. I told you never to come down those stairs when I'm not in this house. It was all right, Lydia. I held on very tight to the banisters all the way. And I didn't once look down the stairwell. So I didn't get dizzy, and I didn't want to jump. Well, don't do it again. It was just that I was lonely. I didn't think you were ever coming home. Lydia, you didn't tell me what you bought. <laughs> a Duravo. What's that? What's a Duravo? Don't ask so many questions, Ellie. All right. Lydia, I think I'll sew, too. I could fix up one of these old ribbons here. May I, Lydia? Yes, yes, so. It will be good for you. Thank you. <laughs> Lydia. Yes? Lydia, could I go shopping someday? Don't be a fool. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I just thought that... No, I suppose you're right. It wouldn't do. Not yet. Lydia, sing with me. You know I never sing. There wasn't any mail today. Wasn't there? No. I thought perhaps there'd be a letter from David. It's been such a long time since he's written, hasn't it? I haven't noticed. Oh, yes. He used to write every week on Tuesday. And I'd get the letter on Thursday. But there wasn't one this week or last or the week before that. Strange, isn't it? But perhaps he's been busy. Perhaps. Still, he never used to be too busy to write. I can't understand it. Do you suppose there's some other reason? What are you trying to say to me, Ellie? Are you hinting perhaps I'm keeping your mail from you? Oh, no. Well, you certainly seem to be. Why should I keep David's letters from you? But I didn't say that. 
I just said it was strange that David hadn't written, that's all. You wouldn't keep David's letters, I know that, Lydia. Go on with your sewing. Yes. I want to finish this ribbon. Stop singing that. Stop it. But, Lydia, it's a hymn. I don't care. I said stop. Or learn something else. That's all you sing day and night, day and night. Same tune over and over and over. Now stop it. Lydia. Lydia, sometimes you frighten me. The way you look at me, you make me think that... Yes, sometimes you frighten me. The way you look at me, you make me think that... That perhaps I'm not getting well. That perhaps I'm still... Crazy. I'm not. I'm not still crazy. Am I, Lydia? Yes? Um, evening. Are you Miss Lydia Haskell? Yes. Well, uh, can I speak to you for a minute? I was here this afternoon. There was no one home. What is it, please? We had a call from Doan Brothers, the undertakers. I'm from the police department. Oh, really? I don't see what the police could want with me. Come in if you wish. Thank you. Sit down. Thank you. Well, there's nothing we want, Miss Haskell, except it's sort of unusual for a woman to order a casket for herself. Unusual? I've heard of many cases of that kind. People who are alone in the world, there's no one else to look after things. Oh, yes, sure, I know. Only it's a little more unusual when you can name the date. The, uh, the undertaker said you wanted the casket held for three weeks. Why three weeks? There must be some reason for it. There is. I'm going to die. I shall die in three weeks or perhaps even before. There's no doubt in my mind about it, and that's why I've ordered the casket. You may call it a premonition if you want. Maybe I could also call it suicide. Well, that's why I'm here, Miss Haskell. I don't know whether you know it, but suicide's a crime in the eyes of the state. A crime for which there is no punishment. Not if it's successful, no. But there is prevention. I know I'm going to die. I feel it. But I have no intention of taking my own life. There's no need to do so. Miss Haskell, this premonition, as you call it, uh, have you any idea what, what brought it on? No. Have you been speaking to anyone? No fortune tellers or anything like that? <laughs> no. Well, what makes you so sure? How do you know you can trust this premonition? You're not an old woman. I, I'd say you're in pretty good health. You've got a lot of good years ahead of you. I have a religion, not a church religion, just one of my own. It preaches that people go on living until they've outgrown their usefulness. Then they die from one cause or another. When that time comes, the desire to live is gone. And only desire keeps the body and soul alive and breathing. Oh, I, I don't understand that. I'm sorry. Miss Haskell... Do you live alone here? Yes. No relations? No housekeeper? I live alone here. Well, it's a pretty large house for a person living alone. There are three floors and far too many rooms. But it's on the outskirts of town. It's quiet and it gives me the privacy I've been looking for. A privacy which you are invading for the first time since I moved here five years ago. I'm sorry, Miss Haskell. I'm only doing my job. I was told to look you up and find out why you bought that casket. Then I think we may assume your job is over. I guess so, but well, the office might ask me to drop back once in a while just to keep in touch, you know. I won't be at home. Why? You don't go out very much, I ask. The folks in town say they don't even see you more than once a week. When maybe. you come, I won't be at home. All right. Sorry to bother you. Good night. Good night. Oh, Miss Haskell, how are you going to die? I don't know, nor do I consider it important. Why should you? Good night. Good night. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Rosalind Russell 
in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Extra, extra. Hear all about the big extras you get with the wonderful Autolite Stay Full battery. How could I help hearing? Extra number one. Autolite Stay Full batteries have an extra large liquid reserve. Need water only three times a year in normal car use? Why, an Autolite Stay Full battery can give aces to an oasis and still have water to spare. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> extra number two. Autolite Stay Full batteries have extra large electrical capacity. That means extra power when you need it most by Cornelius. And listen to me, friend. You don't want to get caught with your battery down, so get an Autolite Stay Full battery right away. <laughs> Set them up in the other alley. All right, extra number three. Autolite Stay Full batteries have fiberglass insulation for extra long life. Why, Methuselah turned green with envy when he heard of those long-life Autolite Stay Full batteries. Wait, don't quit now, Hollow, you're hot. Why, bye, Cornelius, friend. If you knew what I know, you'd switch to Autolite Stay Full batteries right now. You'd pop into your puddle jumper, pour on the power, and set off at a peppy pace down to your nearest Autolite dealer for a splendid new Autolite Stay Full battery. The battery with all the extras. Why, the thought of all those extra features makes me excited, exhilarated, exalted. Exhausted. Uh, you'll be an ex-announcer if you don't be quiet and listen to suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Rosalind Russell as Lydia with Miss Lorene Tuttle as Ellie in The Sisters. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> After he'd gone, I stood there in the hall thinking. Perhaps I'd made a mistake. Perhaps I shouldn't have gone to the morticians. I had thought it would be so clever. But I hadn't thought he might become suspicious, send a policeman, send someone snooping around asking questions, trying to find out things. I was so upset thinking about it, I, I hadn't heard her come down the stairs. Lydia. Ellie, what are you doing down here? What are you doing sitting on the steps in the dark? Lydia. Haven't I told you never to come down here at night? Lydia. What do you want? I heard that man who was here. Lydia, why did you buy the casket? Why are you going to die? You must, Lydia, you must die. I'd be alone if you died. And you know what would happen. They'd send me away like they did once before. The people in the town would come and find me living here and they'd send me away. Go up to bed, Ellie. Go to sleep. How can I sleep? Oh, Lydia, you won't die. Promise me you won't. I promise you. Now go to bed. But why did you buy the casket? And the things you said to that man as if you wanted to die. Why, Lydia? Why do you want to die? I don't want to die. No one does. You have such a lot to live for, haven't you, Ellie? Yes. I've been happy, Lydia. You made me happy. And someday when I'm well again, I'll go back home. And David will be waiting for me. You know he'll be there. You've always told me he'd be waiting. And he'll see that I'm well again and he'll take me back. I'm not so old, am I? David won't see me as old. He told me that, that when I was well, no matter how long it took, he'd still see me as a young girl. That's why I've been happy. Just waiting for the time I can go back to David. Haven't you heard yet? And haven't you learned it? Don't you know yet that you're mad and you'll always be mad? No, don't say that. I'm getting better, Lydia. Yes. You know I'm getting better. Yes, of course. Putting bows in your hair, sewing ribbons all day long, sneaking about the house at night spying on me, singing the same hymn over and over and over until I think I'm going mad, too. Is that why you want to die? To get away from me? Why, I thought you loved me, Lydia. Why should I love you? Look what life has given me and tell me why. You've always spoiled everything for me, even from the time we were children. Why, how could I spoil everything? We were just like the same child, Lydia, twins. You were I, and I was you. We looked the same, yes. We were born the same day, yes, and that's where it ended. You were the nice one. I used to hear them say so. You were even the prettiest, they said, as if they could see any difference between us. Well, whatever you wanted, you had. You smiled so beautifully, and I never smiled. I was the sullen one, the dark cloud in the house. You made it so, Lydia. We all loved you. When your doll was broken, they gave you mine. When you tore your dancing dress, you took mine. You gave it to me, Lydia. I remember you gave it to me. You gave I've it to me. I've always given things to you. I've given you my whole life. I even gave you David. Lydia. You 
were in love with David. He came to our house. Was it you he came to see? Oh, Lydia, I didn't know. You never knew. No one did. I had to stand by and, and watch you take him from me. And when you had your first attack, I was glad. If people said it was a shame, but I was glad. Lydia. Because I knew that he could never have you. Oh, yes, you were going away and be cured. He was going to wait. <laughs> but it wouldn't matter how long it, it took and how long he waits. He'll never be cured and he'll never have you. Never. You hate me. You've always hated me. I see it now. Even when you've been taking care of me. When we came to this town, you didn't bring me here so I'd be cured. You wanted to keep me this way. Man, that's why you took me out of that place. Because they might have made me well again. Go upstairs. You hate me. And now you're going to die. I Leave me without you. anyone. I will not die. Oh, Ellie. Ellie, I'm sorry we had this quarrel. I didn't mean to upset you. It's just that I'm upset myself and, and tired. I didn't mean the things I said. You bought a cask. It was only an idea I had in case anything ever happened to me. You bought a cask. Was it for yourself? Or is it for me? Ellie! You wouldn't. You wouldn't, would you, Lydia? What are you talking about? Hold the lamp up. Hold it close to you. I want to see your face. Go, go, go up to bed. Yes. I can see it in your eyes. It is for me. You're going to kill me. You're going to murder me. Don't be a fool, Ellie. It's so you want to get rid of me. Because you hate me, you... Oh, now I see. I see. You love David. And you're going to kill me. And they'll come and find me and bury me. And they'll think it's you. Be quiet. That's why you bought the casket. They'll think it's you who is dead. Because no one knows I'm living here. And then you'll go away and, and, and you'll go back to David. And you'll say that Lydia has died. And he'll think you are me and that you're well again. And he'll marry you. You'll have him. You'll be Ellie. You'll have David in my place. Did you hear what I said? Be quiet. <laughs> now go upstairs and get to bed. Oh, Lydia. Lydia. How can you be so wicked? <laughs> Ellie. Ellie, are you awake? Ellie. Uh, dear, you mustn't think anymore about what we said tonight. Do you hear? It's not so, Ellie. It's just your imagination. You mustn't think about it. It will be bad for you. Are you asleep, Ellie? She's not asleep. She's lying over there on the other side of the room, staring at me through the dark. She knows it was the truth tonight. She's going to die. I'm going to kill her. That quarrel. I shouldn't have let her know. I lost my temper, stupid. Now I must... Oh, I must think clearly. Now what was my plan? How was I going to kill her? It mustn't look like murder. They'll suspect things then. It must be suicide. And it must be soon now that she knows... suspect. I'll be Ellie to him. Ellie cured and happy again. I'll learn to smile. First she must die. Now, which way is best? The stairs. Of course, the stairwell. She gets dizzy if she looks down into the stairwell. It will be so easy. In a day or two, that policeman will come back to the house. They'll find her, and they'll think it's me. The stairwell. Three 
floors from the attic here. Three floors straight down. It's so easy when you think clearly. The stairwell, of course. Ellie, you mustn't cry anymore. You hear me? Why are you afraid of the dark? I'll light the lamp for you. There, dear. That's better, isn't it? Why, you're shivering. Are you cold? Come. Put your wrapper on. We'll go down to the parlor and light a fire. And I'll make a nice cup of hot milk for you. Come, Ellie. Ellie, stop acting like this. Now. Now, come, dear. Here's your wrapper. Put it around your shoulders. That's a girl now. Get up. Get up now. I'll carry the lamp. Give me your hand, dear. Why, you're cold as ice. Now, be careful. Walk slowly. There we are. Now, hold on to the banister, dear. That's right. I'll hold the lamp up high so you can see better. I'm afraid. The stairwell. It's right here, dear. You see? I'm afraid. Ellie, you must get over that fear. Look, Kelly. Just look down. There's nothing to frighten you. Look down the stairwell, Ellie. No. I'm holding you, dear. Now just lean over and look down. You can see all the way. No. Don't make me look. Don't make me. It's nothing. No. Nothing, nothing at all. Are you dizzy? I'm holding you. Let me go. I can't stand it. Come closer. No. Lean over. Lean over. No, no. No, you hear, Ellie. Let me get back. Ellie, look down. No. No. No, Ellie. Let me go. Lean over. Look down. Look down. It was brought to my mind, of course, because this is the house just here. Uh, this one? Uh, the next one we're coming to, yes. Uh, she was in to see us just a few days ago. Came in to order the casket. Uh, she saw a casket she wanted, and then she told me it was for herself. Hmm. She, she must have had a premonition. Uh, I notified the police, of course, why she said she wanted me to hold the casket three weeks. Then, just the day before yesterday, the police came back to the house here and found her lying at the bottom of the stairwell, dead. Oh, she'd been dead about two days. Hmm. Funny how she knew. And the banister up on the attic floor broke away and she fell. Uh, did she have any people? No, lived alone, they tell me. We're going to bury her tomorrow. Haskell, the name was. Haskell. Strange, living all by herself here in a big three-story frame house. Yes, isn't it? Say, well, what is it? Oh, my, my imagination, I guess, I... I could have sworn I saw a light in the attic window just now. Oh, I couldn't have been. The police have shut it up. Yes, yes, of course. That story of yours really gave me the creeps. Mm. Let's walk on. Uh, what a queer thing the power of suggestion is. You've conveyed it to me. Well, you, you know, just now I thought I could hear someone upstairs in there. Uh, a woman. Uh, a woman singing... A woman? Yes, uh, sort of uh, crooning to herself. Some kind of hymn.
may uh, happen. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, look, supposing, just supposing, you didn't already have an Autolite Stay Full battery in your car, what would be the first thing you'd do tomorrow morning? Eat breakfast. Mm. Then what? Well, then I... Uh, right, right. You'd make hay with your coupe right straight down to your nearest Autolite dealer and ask for an Autolite Stay Full battery, that beautifully built battery with the biggest bunch of bonus features you ever saw. Why, that Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Has extra electrical capacity and an extra long life. What's more, friends, the Autolite people make over 400 other automotive, aviation, and marine parts in their 26 nationwide plants. Every part famous for its Autolite engineered dependability. And remember, friends, Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered resistor spark plugs. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now here again is Miss Rosalind Russell. It has been a great pleasure to appear here tonight on Suspense. And I want to thank Tony Leader and his fine cast, and especially Lorraine Tuttle, for her splendid performance as Ellie. I know none of you will want to miss James Cagney's appearance next week on radio's outstanding theater of thrills in a story called No Escape, another gripping study in... Suspense. Miss Rosalind Russell may currently be seen in the independent artist production, The Velvet Touch. Tonight's suspense play, The Sisters, was written by George Wells, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, suspense will present such stars as Ronald Coleman, William Bendix, Ethel Barrymore, Frank Sinatra, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear James Cagney in No Escape. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Autolite salutes the automotive industry on the occasion of the observance tonight in Detroit of the production of the 100 million motor vehicle. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Miss Rosalind Russell in Consideration, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Uh, Hollywood and Vine, driver. And can you make it snappy? I'm late. Can I make it snappy? I got Autolite spark plugs. What's snappier? Autolite spark plugs? Which type? Regular or resistor? Why resistor, my hurried huckster? Only Autolite resistor spark plugs. Hold on, my haloed hackster. Let me say it. Only Autolite resistor spark plugs can give you smoother performance on leaner gas mixtures, greater gas savings, and double life under equal service conditions. You're right there, all right. Of course I'm right. And it's all because every Autolite resistor spark plug has an exclusive built-in 10,000 ohm resistor that permits a wider gap setting and makes all these advantages possible. So, friends, next time you have your car serviced, ask your dealer to install a set of Autolite spark plugs. Remember, whether you choose Autolite regular spark plugs or wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with consideration and the performance of Rosalind Russell, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Well, Gloom, don't I rate a good morning? I'm sorry. Good morning, darling. You know, the Masons have asked us to cocktails tomorrow. I told them I didn't know I'd check with you. Oh, oh by the way, I'm completely out of aspirin again. Would you mind picking me up a bottle on the way... Charles, you're not reading the paper, are you? No, Ellen, I'm not. Oh, what's the matter? Everything's the matter, darling, everything. Oh, what is it? Whatever... 
Oh, come, dear. Nothing could be as bad as the look on your face. I'm afraid it's worse. Well, dear, what on earth can... We're in bad trouble, honey. Charles, what do you mean? Business has been pretty bad since the war. Our contracts ran out, and so you wouldn't have to go without. I took out a mortgage. Mortgage? On everything. House, car, even your jewelry. I figured on business getting better, but the note came due, so I paid it off out of company fund. Oh, don't look look at me like that. Tom and I had a Navy contract coming up that would cover it, and I wouldn't have to dip into our savings. But the Navy canceled, and now next week the auditors are coming in to examine the books, and I have to cover it. Oh, oh, why didn't you tell me? I, I figure roughly we should have between fifteen and 18000 in the safety deposit box. I want you to go down this morning, take out 10000 put it into a cashier's check, and bring it to my office before 3 this afternoon. Charles, I... I know. All I can say now is that I'm sorry, but, well, just do it, will you, please? Charles, I've got to tell you something. I can't bring the money down to you this afternoon. Honey, you have to. Because... Because there isn't any... What did you say, Ellen? Well, you know how I love to go to the races... You took me to my first one, remember, Charles? We went with Zell and Tom, and, well, you always used to say that if you lose, so what? You'd spend it on a nightclub and you'd hate the floor show, remember? Go ahead. Well, I don't know how it happened. I started betting here at home on the phone and I got in deep and began doubling up. Ellen, I'll go to prison if I don't have that oh, money. Oh, I had to catch us one winner. Just one and I'd been even. Just one, Charles, but it wouldn't come in. I don't believe you. You couldn't do that to me. Charles, in one month I'd gone through $22,000 including some money I borrowed from the bank. Charles. Charles. I didn't mean to. Oh, Charles, don't hate me. Charles. That night, he didn't come home till very late. Very late. And when he did, he... He was different. He wasn't angry with me. It's all right, darling. Don't you worry. Oh, what are we going to do? It won't be so bad. Oh, you can't go to jail. Of course not. Well, uh, have you... Have you worked out something? Everything. Oh, I'm sick. I, I'm so sorry. What are you going to do? No worrying now. Oh, but I do worry, and I should. Darling, don't work yourself up. I've already made arrangements, and everything's going to be taken care of. Now, take your aspirin and go to bed. Hmm? Aspirin? Even in the midst of all this, you didn't forget. No, Ellen. I'm never going to forget anything that will make you rest easier. From then on, he began to work a great deal at night. Work for hours alone in his little laboratory that he had built out there in the garage. I could feel a tension mounting inside me, building and building and building till my nerves became so taut that I couldn't sleep. The least sound awakened me. One night in particular, I thought I heard the muffled whine of a dog in our backyard. We had a high wire fence completely enclosing our grounds. It would be impossible for any animal to get in. I raised up on one elbow, listened intently. There it was again. I got up and went to the window. Saw nothing. There was no reason to arouse Charles. He'd worked late out there again. I slipped on a robe and went down the stairs. I opened the back door. Then again, this time it was distinct. There was no doubt. It was coming from the laboratory. I walked across the yard to the garage and waited. There were no more sounds. As I reached for the latch, I noticed that my hands were wet. And then I stopped. There was a new lock on the laboratory door. In the practical light of the next day, I convinced myself that I had a very bad dream and that I'd better watch my nerves. That evening, Charles brought home a dinner guest, Bill Dover, an old friend of the family and our insurance agent. After dinner, Bill leaned back and did a cigar. Well, how about it? What, Bill? The insurance, darling. He's talking about increasing our policy. Oh, well, I don't know. Maybe sometime... You've come a long way. Your standard of living is higher. If something should happen to either of you... Well, maybe things seem more prosperous than they are. Right now, I don't think we can even... Well, let let him talk, Ellen. But you... You see, we have a new family plan. Talking to Chuck about it this afternoon. 
where both of your policies could be increased to 30000 apiece, in other words, trebled, while your premiums would only be twice what you're paying now. But we can't afford anything like that right now. Don't you agree, dear? Well, if there's anything we can afford, it's this. Oh. We've discussed it before. Right up the payments, dear. <laughs> oh, well, as the fellow says, I just happen to have them here in my briefcase. This is very wise. But now, please, no, wait I a minute. No, I don't mean it as a salesman. Insurance is always a wise investment. Security. It isn't pleasant, but should something happen to either of you, the other would receive $30,000. That's security. I watched with a sort of numb helplessness as Bill filled out the papers. Charles signed his name and handed them to me. He looked at me, and then he lowered his eyes. I looked down at the application form that he put into my hand. It was a mass of fine print, all those clauses. But one word jumped up at me. One word that stood out as if it were printed in bold type in big letters. The word was murder. I found myself reading, Suicide by the insured within two years. Following date policy is in effect, voids all claims. Murder of insured by beneficiary or any party connected in a fraudulent manner with party connected in a fraudulent manner with beneficiary in said murder voids all claims. Any fraudulent act. Thirty thousand. Well, Helen, sign it. Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> That night, Charles did something I'd never known him to do before. He got drunk. Bill left, finally, about midnight. And I got Charles upstairs somehow. I helped him out of his clothes, and he stumbled into bed and fell into a troubled sleep. I reached down and picked up a letter that had fallen out of his pocket. The letterhead said the city health department. Office of the veterinary surgeon. Dear Mr. Forrester... The autopsy you requested to be performed on your dog revealed no trace of poison any place in his system. Blood and all organs seem normal. Therefore, it is the belief of this office that your dog died of natural causes, probably a hidden heart ailment, and that there are no grounds from this examination to be suspicious of your neighbor. Sincerely yours, Dr. Lois Morrill, examiner. <laughs> I stood there over my sleeping husband. All these terrible words that I'd heard and seen tonight. Fraud. Beneficiary. Autopsy. Murder. And two other words that Charles was mumbling in his sleep. Autolite is bringing you Rosalind Russell in consideration. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, uh, driver, how is it you know so much about white gap Autolite resistor spark plugs? I used to have a set of worn-out spark plugs, and this old buggy jumped and jumped like a bucking bronco. <laughs> then I heard a guy named Wilcox on the radio. Oh, did he say that Autolite resistor spark plugs let your engine idle smoother than silk, run better on leaner gas mixtures, and actually save gas? Yeah, and he... And did he say that with Autolite resistor spark plugs, your engine starts like a whirlwind and gets off to a galloping start in cold weather? Yeah, he said that... That the... Autolite resistor spark plugs have doubled the life of ordinary spark plugs under equal conditions? conditions? Yeah. Everyone with old worn-out spark plugs should tell his dealer to install a set of Autolite spark plugs right away. Either Autolite regular spark plugs or wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, because you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Rosalind Russell, with John McIntyre in consideration. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The next morning, I woke with a frightful sense of lurking danger. Charles was up and gone. There was a note that said, Sorry, darling. As I got out of bed, I stepped on something cold. It was a key to a padlock. 
The key to the new laboratory. I went out there. I stood in the tiny room, a maze of odd-shaped bottles, test tubes, and boxes. I was about to leave when my hand brushed against the side of an old steamer trunk. It was ice cold and damp. It was locked, and I couldn't force it open. So I called a locksmith, and he came over. I'll have it open in a minute. Please hurry. You just slip this little rod in like this, a little turn, and... Don't open it. Well, I thought you wanted me... No, no, just open the lock. Don't lift the lid. Well, I can't very well... Don't lift the lid! There. Hey, you always keep dead guinea pigs in trunks? Oh, uh, no, it, uh, it was just part of an experiment. What killed him? There ain't a mark on him. Well, uh, the experiment. Give me my money. Yes, yes, of course. Thanks. After the locksmith left, I forced myself to look through the trunk. Nothing else in it. Nothing but a few pieces of wrapping paper. Wrapping paper with the words, Frozen Carbonic Company. Dry ice. Printed on it. Dry ice. A guinea pig. A dog. I got in the car and went to our doctor's office. Dr. Hanson might tell me. I'll sit down here. Thank you. Now, what's our trouble, Ellen? Jay, maybe I'm being silly. Oh, nothing silly if it worries you. Well, Charles has been puttering around his laboratory. You know how he does. Mm -hmm. And he's been doing some experimenting with... with dry ice. And I... I've heard some things about it. Oh, what kind of things? Oh, that that it was dangerous. Say, if left in a closed room, it might even kill a person. Oh, 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 now listen. Of all the chemicals he plays around with, dry ice is the least of your work. Would it kill a person? Oh, really? Well, would it? Well, I, I suppose it would. It evaporates into carbon dioxide gas, would actually cause suffocation. Hard to go. Yeah, there wouldn't be any trace of poison in the system. It would seem like natural causes. Ah, uh, what's that? And then, then if it evaporated, there wouldn't be anything left, like water. No way to know. Nothing to trace. Uh, what are you driving now? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm upset. I guess you're right. <laughs> I am being silly. Oh, now, look, Ellen. Charles is really a brilliant man. He knows exactly what everything he experiments with can do. Yes, yes of course. Of course. <laughs> ah, you didn't sleep well again last night, did you? No, no, I... I'll take two of those sleeping tablets and get to bed early. Sleeping tablets? Well, the ones I gave Charles for you. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> That night, I sat in the upstairs den, read until my eyes burned without having the least idea what was written in the book. An hour passed by. Two. Three. There were no more sounds coming from the bedroom. Charles was asleep. I wanted to sleep myself. Desperately, I had to sleep. But I wouldn't go into that room with him. I remember hearing the clock in the living room strike three. The night breeze shake loose a shutter downstairs. The distant cry of a tomcat, and then, unmistakably, I sensed a chill coming over the room, surrounding me. A pale light was filtering through the Venetian blinds. Morning was near. The room was like ice. Ice! <laughs> I just brought a blanket for you. I thought maybe you were cold. No, I... I... You've been dreaming. Now, there. I don't want a blanket. All right. Here, take these. Take what? A couple of your aspirin. Here. No. No! No, I don't want them! I apologized an hour later for getting so upset. I even made coffee for him before he left for work. I was wary now, you see. It was far better not to let him know that I'd found out. And I'd have the advantage on him. And he wasn't able to deny it and change his tactics. So now I held the advantage, and I... I... Hello, darling. Surprise. Oh, Charles. 
You're home early. Well, don't look so disappointed. Expecting the ice man? Look. What is it? Open it up. An orchid. It, it's beautiful. Not half as beautiful as my lovely wife. And that ain't all. More? Lots. Tonight, my darling, we're going out. Dinner at the plaza, the show at the green hat, the gypsy violinist at Little Asia, and champagne. Nothing but champagne, all the champagne we can drink. We're going to pack into this night everything you ever wanted and ever loved. All the places we used to go. Tonight's yours. Why, Charles? Why? What well, does there have to be a why? Usually. Not to this husband. Well, I mean, I you don't think... You deserve it. That's enough. Now, upstairs and into your best. Tonight's the night. We started on the merry-go-round, but all that I could think of was, tonight is the night. We went to all those places. Charles laughed a lot, but there was something horrible in the back of his eyes. They didn't laugh. It was very late when we got home. There was one of those notices on the door you get when a telegram has been delivered and no one was home to receive it. He called Western Union and listened while they read it to him, and then he put his coat back on came over and put his arms around me. Ellen, there's a new contract that came in this afternoon. I've got to go down to the office. But it's nearly three in the morning. I'll call you when I get there. Well, if you have to. It's a rush deal, and I've got to figure out a formula so the boys can work on it in the morning. So, uh, go to bed, Don. Western Union, please. Just a moment. Western Union. This is Mrs. Charles Forrester, 1552 Carlton Manor Way. You sent a wire that was just read over the phone. My husband wanted me to get the exact wording. Would you read it again, please? One moment, please. Here it is. Go ahead. Charles, tried reaching you by phone. Auditor still working on books. Call office immediately. Signed, Tom. Thank you. The auditors were still working on the books. Charles's boss was trying to contact him. Well, Charles wasn't worried. He'd have the missing money and a little extra besides. The difference between $30,000 and... Hello? Oh, darling. How do you feel? All right. I called to tell you that I wouldn't be home until very late tonight. Maybe not even until tomorrow. Something came up at the office, and I'll have to drive out of town. Oh? Now, I want you to go to bed. I will. You haven't had a good night's sleep in a week, and I'm worried about you. Take a couple of aspirin and hit the hay. Why don't you sleep in the upstairs den, and I won't wake you if I should have to. All right. Promise? Promise. Goodbye. Tonight's the night. Yes, of course, he wouldn't be home when it happened. He'd be out of town. But then what? Where would it come from? Oh, my head was aching so that I could hardly see. I took three aspirin and sat down to wait for him. Hello? Is Charles Forrester there? Well, uh, who's calling him? Well, I'm terribly sorry to bother you at this hour, but I'm not sure that this is the Forrester I want. Uh, this is the Frozen Carbonic Company. You wouldn't know whether your Mr. Forrester ordered some dry ice for tonight. Well, why? Well, the plant's shutting down for the night, and this fellow made such a fuss about it, said it was so important that uh, I wanted to make sure he found it. He said for us to leave it on the back ramp, but he hasn't picked it up yet. I guess he'll find it all right. You were... Uh... You must have the wrong forester. Oh, I'm sorry to bother you. The upstairs den. That's why he wanted me to sleep there. A small room where dry ice could do it suffocating faster, more surely, more believably. And realizing it... Why wasn't I excited? My heart wasn't beating fast anymore. In fact, I felt quite cool. Drowsy. Drowsy. I, I shook my head... Oh, it still ached, the aspirin. Why hadn't it stopped my headache? I'd, I'd have to take two more. I started to the medicine cabinet. Oh! I... 
I couldn't walk straight. I opened the cabinet and got out the bottle of aspirin. I'd already taken five. Why didn't they? No. No. They weren't aspirin at all. They were sleeping tablets. He tricked me. I'd been drugged. I had to run. Stop him. I was helpless. He won. I got to keep awake. Got to. Got to. Yes? Hello, uh, Ellen? Yes, who is this? Uh, this is Tom. Where's Charles? Well, isn't he there? He said he was going to the office. Oh, I've been trying to get him all night. He even sent a wire. Oh, no. <laughs> now, Ellen, things aren't as bad as all that. Look, I've known you for 20 years. Think I haven't made mistakes, Sean, wrong. I knew he took that money months ago, and I, I figured it must have been for a pretty good reason. All I wanted was for Charles to tell me about it. Well, I, I've already made up for it out of my own pocket, and, well, you and Chuck can pay me back whenever you can. He's much more valuable to me than a few dollars. Well, do you hear me, Ellen? Yes. Yes, Tom, I hear you. He doesn't know that, does he? It's all right. It's all all right. That's why I wanted him to come down. All he had to do was ask me. And, well, after all, that's what friends are for. And... Oh, God, this stuff. Now, I've you, got you, you go to sleep, Ellen. We'll get it all straightened out in the morning. Uh, give Zell a ring one of these days. She's home a lot. Maybe you two could... Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's all right. I've got to tell him. Information. What? What is the number of the Frozen Carbonic Company, please? Just a moment. It is in your directory. The number is Elm Four Four Eight Nine Two. Thank you. Elm Four. Five, five, nine, nine, two, two. Rosen Carbonic Company. Hello. This, this is Mrs. Forrester. Yes? My husband is coming down to pick up some dry ice from you. I want you to tell him that I called and said everything was all right. Un understand? Lady, your husband picked up the dry ice about 20 minutes ago. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Forrester? I... I hear you. If he comes back, I'll... Bill, come on, Bill. Bill, I'll be home, sir. Huh? Hello? Bill, this is Ellen... Is Tom home? No, he's still at the office, she says. No matter. I I want you to talk to me. Ellen, do you know what time it no is? No matter what happens, keep talking. Don't let me go to sleep. Is it a game? Say, are you all right? Please, just talk. Tell me what you've been doing. Tell me everything you did today. Oh, I had a terribly fascinating day. I got up at 8 and made Tom's breakfast. I got Lola off to school, and at 10.30, I dusted and vacuumed the living room. Then at 12, uh, how are we doing? Ellen? Oh, Ellen. Ellen! Ellen. Ellen. Wake up, Ellen. Charles. No, no, no. It's Tom, Ellen. What? Tom, Chuck's boss. Phil, what are you doing here? Well, you fell asleep while I was talking to you. I tried to call you back. Then when Tom got home, I told yes, him yes, about well, it. Well, that can wait, Phil. Uh... Listen, I have to talk fast. Are you awake now, Ellen? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Well, look. Charles is downstairs. I brought him home. He doesn't know anything about our conversation last night. And he doesn't want you to know that he wasn't at the office. Have you got it? Where was he? Well... The police picked him up in his car. I went down to the station and got him. He was so groggy they thought he was drunk. Crazy guy had taken a couple of sleeping pills, put off to the side of the road, and gone to sleep. They noticed his car because the windows were frosted up. Frosted yes. up? Yes, yes, all frosted on the outside. The cops couldn't understand. Oh. Come in, Charles. Come on, let's go, Zell. Yeah, sure. Hello, darling. $30,000. You wanted me to have the money. And you were going to die. Hush, so that... darling, hush. 
It just seemed the only way to make things right. They could never be right without you. Oh, Ellen, I love you. I know, darling. I know. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Rosalind Russell, with John McIntyre as Charles. Here we are, Hollywood and Vine. Say, I just figured out something. You're Hollow Wilcox. Right, my friend, and next time I see you, I'll tell you about Autolite Bullseye Seal Beam Headlights, the new safe headlight that's guaranteed to function even when the lens is cracked or broken. Got them, Mr. Wilcox, got them. Well, they're unbeatable, just like Autolite spark plugs. And they're only one of more than 400 products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, and bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, Kirk Douglas will be our star. The play is called Never Steal a Butcher's Wife. And it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Night Suspense Play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Consideration is an original play for radio by Richard Vaudra. Rosalind Russell will soon be seen in the Columbia Pictures comedy, A Woman of Distinction. You can buy Autolite regular or resistor spark plugs, Autolite stainful batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite... Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you the story of a woman who holds death over her husband's head when the bow breaks, starring Miss Rosalind Russell. Say, Harlow, I just saw one of those old-fashioned electric autos. Old-fashioned? How about your car, Hap? Well, mine uses gasoline. Does gas crank your engine, run your radio, your lights, your heater, your cigarette lighter? Well, no. Electricity does. You bet it does, Hap, and it's all produced and stored right under the hood of your car. And that's where Autolite comes in, Hap, because Autolite designs and builds complete electrical systems. Used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars. You mean Autolite makes generators, coils, and distributors, eh, Harlow? They sure do, Hap. With all the units and their thousands of component parts, related by Autolite engineering design and Autolite manufacturing skill, to give the smoothest performance money can buy. Sounds like a winning combination to me, Harlow. It is, Hap, believe me. So, friends, take a tip from me and specify Autolite original factory parts when replacements are needed for your Autolite-equipped car. You'll find it pays, because you're always right with Autolite. And now, with When the Bow Breaks and the performance of Miss Rosalind Russell, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. I remember when I was little. I remember you used to swing me in the garden. And the big maple tree and a rusty squeak as I went up and down. Up and down. Grandfather, don't let me fall. I want you to hold me like you used to when I was hurt. I'm afraid. Because I'm dying. Just the way you died, Grandfather. And why should I die? How did it all happen? This is it, baby. It looks very nice. 
Oh, oh, Harry, please be careful of my coat. You're dragging it there oh, on the ground. I'm sorry, Ev. Here, you, you hold it while I get the key out. I'll get the suitcases later. Now, wait a minute, baby. Let's do this right. Oh, oh Harry, put me down. People are watching. Now, let them They'll watch. Not... We're married. This is the way it's done. Oh, you've got a lot to learn. All right, now. Put me down, Harry. Please. Harry, I asked you to put me down. Will you please Baby, put me... Baby, I'm sorry. Oh, you're sweet. I, I'm tired. I, I didn't mean to be angry. I'm tired, that's all. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, you like it? Oh, it's a very nice house, dear. I, I'm sure we'll be comfortable. Not bad for a short order deal. Take a look around. Here, open this door. It's a closet. Yeah, it's not bad, eh? They're all like that. Lots of room. Living room, dining room through here, kitchen. Harry, please, can I sit down for a minute? My head's splitting. Yeah, sure, baby, sure. On the sofa, huh? That's not bad, huh? Come on now. Off with the shoes. Oh, come on, put your feet up. Oh, thank you, dear. It, it all looks very nice. You must have spent a lot of money, though. Ah, money, nothing. As soon as the probate judge turns the real money loose, we'll get something that'll knock your eye out. I don't want to talk about that, Harry. I don't want to even think about it. Never again. No, of course not, baby. What's the matter with me? Of course you don't. I don't want to think about it, Grandfather. But I have to talk about it to you. There'll be the lawyers to pay and the inheritance tax. I never realized how very much you were worth. But you never spoke much about money. It was always there ever since I can remember. Funny. I never thought about it and until after you'd gone. Harry did, though. I lied to you about Harry. I'm sorry I didn't meet him the way I said. I, I picked him up, Grandfather, on the beach. I went looking for a man and I found him. The men you chose for me were so weak. I wanted someone like you, like Harry. It wasn't respectable of a woman in her late 30s to do that, was it? I'm sorry. Well, honey, I guess you didn't know that I had a feel for interior decorating, did you? No, no, I didn't. Maybe when we get the dough, I can... Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, baby. I, I was figuring maybe I'd go in the business. Harry, how did you know they'd let me go? How did you know all this wouldn't be wasted, or... Or maybe you'd be here with another girl. You're the girl, Mousy. Only you. Besides, they can depend it on you. Why, I watched that jury. You're high class. They believed you. Yesterday. I didn't think I'd be married now and in a new house. I thought I... Oh, forget it. You've been acquitted, and that's it. From here on in... We're... Harry! Baby, baby, you're jumpy. Yes, I'm jumpy. Harry... Relax. Married couples have callers. Probably the next door neighbors. You stay right here. I'll get rid of them. Harry Stryker. Fancy meeting you here. What do you want, Corcoran? <gasps> he doesn't say glad to see. He doesn't say come in and have a drink. All he says is, what do you want, Corcoran? We're busy. No statements. No statements? You just got married, didn't you? You moved into a new house. Your wife beat a murder rap yesterday. No statement. <laughs> Your news. Harry, make him go away. Harry, please. Mrs. Stryker, well, well, congratulations on all counts. Marriage, murder, and money. All right, Corcoran, out. Are you kidding? <laughs> you and Evie are good for five or six more front pages. Mm. You're my babies, my story of the year. I'm going to bounce you. You can beat me to it by walking out, but fast. Why don't you leave us alone? The trial is over. The state is finished with us. Why can't you be... Finished, Evie? You were acquitted, that's what you mean. You can never be tried again for the same murder. And please... Not even what? if you said to me it might amuse your readers to know, Mr. Corcoran, that I really did murder my grandfather. They can't touch you. I'm going to work you over, boy, so that you'll never chew a steak again. I would. Then get out. Okay. But first I came here to tell you something. Every go in the next room. No, no. What do you want, Mr. Corcoran? Oh, nothing much, Mrs. Stryker. I just wanted to tell you that I'm going to do a Sunday feature on you. I'm going to call it She Has Him in the Palm of Her Hand. No, no. Forget about us, please. Harry, give him some money. Tell him to stop. <laughs> you couldn't pay me enough, Evie. The story of why you hold this guy's life in your hands is 
too good. What do you mean by that, Crack? I knew your wife would beat the case a minute, and I laid eyes on her, Harry. <laughs> that holier-than-thou look, grandfather known by one and all to be a wretched old man, Myerson as a lawyer... Since. You've written about those things, Mr. Cochran. Don't you think that after uh, all wait the public... Wait a minute, I'm leading up to it. If the autopsy showed your grandfather had a disease, it would have killed him anyway in a few more months. So, verdict, Well, suicide. why can't you understand that suicide? He knew, he knew he was going to die. I don't buy it. But I buy this. Harry, you were never brought to trial because they couldn't tie you into it. You had an alibi for the night the old man drank that poison. Yeah, I wasn't there. Yeah, the DA knew that you're a photographer among other things, and had access to cyanide, but he couldn't hang anything on you. So you weren't tried for murder. She was. She can't be again. Not for that one. Harry, I'm tired of this. Mr. Cochran is trying to frighten us, that's all. Will you ask him to leave? Now, hold it, baby. Go on, Cochran, get to the point. Sure. Well, like I say, you weren't indicted. But you could be, if your wife talked. Talked? But there's nothing for me to talk about. What, what, what could I say? You could say that Harry got the cyanide for you and you worked it out together to get the old man's money. Then they'd try Harry, not you, Evie, because you've been acquitted. I won't listen. I won't. Okay, okay. So long, Cochran. Sure. <laughs> Don't get sore. If you didn't do it, you haven't got a thing to worry about, Harry. But if you did, you better be nice to Mrs. Stryker because maybe someday she'll get mad. And if she talks, it's bye-bye, Harry. So long, Cochran. <laughs> You got him in the palm of your hand, Evie. Remember, they can't touch you for it. When Harry came back from the door, I knew what he was thinking. What that horrible newspaper reporter had said. He wouldn't look at me. He just went to a table and poured a drink. I was afraid of him. I wanted him to hold me and tell me it was all right. Like you used to. But he didn't. And then I wanted to run away. Anywhere. Get on a boat. Fly. Never see Harry Stryker again. Run, run, run. Where but, you going, baby? Well, I... I, I need some air. I thought I'd now go don't out. don't be silly. You don't want to go out there. Corcoran's probably still hanging around. Harry. Harry. What? What is it, Marcy? Harry. It's all right, isn't it? I mean, you don't believe what he said. No, of course not. He's a snooper, that's all. It, it wasn't the money, was it, Harry? You didn't want me just because of the money. No, baby, I'm no. not pretty. I'm not clever. You don't love me, do you? Why should I attract a man like you? It was the money, wasn't it? You're it upset, baby. Look, go lie down, will you? It's okay. Everything's okay. Say it. Say you love me. You never have. Please. Harry. Harry, look at me. Tell me you think I'm pretty. Harry, say nice things to me. Tell me you love me. Harry, Keep please. your voice down. Corcoran's still outside. He's listening. That was it then. All the time. That's all you cared about, the money. It's never been me. All I wanted was to love you and to have you and to be... I'll, I'll get you a drink. <laughs> no. No, no, no. Oh, I wish I were dead. I wish I'd told them the truth. I should have said, I'm guilty. We're both guilty. Harry and I did it. We murdered him. We murdered Grandfather. <laughs> Baby... Don't ever say that again, not even to yourself. Don't even think it. When he finished what he had to say, he just looked at me. There was death in my new husband's eyes. Autolite is bringing you Miss Rosalind Russell and <coughs> Sheldon Leonard in When the Bow Breaks. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. <laughs> oh, uh, Hap. Hey, Hap. Hey, 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 hmm? Hap. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, I don't know. I was just proving to myself how important the Autolite electrical system is to my Autolite equipped car. Well, it's the lifeline of your car, Hap. And Autolite designs and builds complete electrical systems, including the coil, distributor, generator, and starting motor for many leading makes of our finest cars. 
Autolite electrical systems are built to give you the smoothest performance money can buy. I'm sure glad my car is Autolite equipped. Right, Hap. So, friends, because the electrical system of your car is so important to the smooth, efficient, and economical operation of your car, it will pay you to treat your car occasionally to a checkup at your nearest authorized Autolite service station, whose name is listed in the classified section of your telephone book, or at the dealer who sells your make of car. In either place, or at the garage or repair shop displaying the Autolite Original Factory Parts sign, you can be sure of getting Autolite Original Factory Parts in case your Autolite-equipped car needs replacements. And you'll find it pays, because you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Rosalind Russell in Elliot Lewis's production of When the Bow Breaks, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I remember the scent of our garden. I remember when they used to swing me in the evening before supper and the honeysuckle, sweet, drifting about us. We were happy, weren't we? Not like the sadness that came afterwards and the bitter taste that isn't the taste of honeysuckle. Why am I dying, Grandfather? Where are you? Hold my hand that I shan't be afraid of the dark. Afraid of Harry standing there so close. This dark, angry face looking down at me. You've got to get hold of yourself, Evie. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, all right. This is no good. Don't you see what Corcoran wants? If he can get us at each other's throats, he'll have us and his lousy story. But I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. How can you think You've such a thing? You've got to get straightened out. The way you are now, you'll spill over the first time anyone puts pressure on you. I won't, Harry, honestly. I'll never say a word. I won't. I just want to be happy with you. I want you to love me. Sure, baby, sure. But you've got to understand, like Cochran says, it's my neck now, not yours. We've got to be careful. Harry, maybe if I went away somewhere, alone, maybe I could rest and forget the trial and, and go somewhere and rest. I'll come back. You wouldn't have to worry about me saying anything. Stop Everything it. will be all right when I come back. You'll let me go, won't you, Harry? You wouldn't do anything to stop me. Harry! Shut Harry! Up, Harry! You... Oh. Cut it out! Oh, honey, I I didn't want to do that. You you got to believe me, I didn't. Well, you see what you like. I've got to watch you, take care of you. You hit me. Nobody ever hit me, ever. It's all right, it's all right, Mouse. Don't touch me, don't. There you see, all of a sudden you're afraid of me, and it's just because of that Corcoran guy who... Look, you mustn't be afraid of me. We're in the clear, don't you see? It's all downhill now. Your grandfather was already dying, only we didn't know it. So when we when, when we did what we did, then luck was with us. So we're in the clear. They couldn't prove anything against you then. They can't now. I've always been afraid of you. I've always done what you wanted me to do. Part of it was because I loved you. But most of it because I'm afraid. You never let anything get in your way. Grandfather was in your way. Now maybe it's me. Are you saying that this was all my idea? Are you saying that you never asked me to help you get rid of the old man? Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm tired. Yeah, that's it. You're tired. Well, you make me a drink. I'll get the bags out of the car. You've got to start getting domestic, Mousy. You're, you're an old married woman now. He went out to get the suitcases, but left the front door open. It was too cold to leave the door open. He wanted it that way so that he could see me or hear me if I picked up the telephone. Oh, you mustn't laugh when I tell you that in the middle of the living room standing there, I felt the same way I did when you punished me. When you used to put me in the hall closet and make me stand in the dark with the door closed. I must have been a very naughty little girl sometimes. Is that why I killed you, Grandfather? That night I had a dream. It was a funny dream. There was an enormous alarm clock in the middle of a field. The sun was shining and you and I were dancing in time to the ticking of the clock. Then, then Harry came along and he tried to dance too, but he was clumsy and tripped and fell down. He waved his arms and his mouth went open and shut when we couldn't hear him because of the ticking. <laughs>
That's so funny. <laughs> Harry. Oh, nothing. No, nothing. It was just a dream. Yeah, well, tell me about it. Well, I can't. I, I don't remember. It was just funny. You didn't sound like you were asleep. Well, I was. Really, I was. Well, maybe you figured out a way to tip off Corcoran about me, eh? Maybe that's what no. was funny. No, no, Harry, it was a dream. You haven't but... been kidding me. Why do you think I've watched you every minute? I know what's on your oh, mind. you're wrong. I thought we were happy. With what you're holding over my head? With what you can do to me? Are you kidding? Now, listen. I haven't slept since the trial, and you know why? It's because I'm afraid of you. Every time we go to the store, every time we go out anywhere, I'm waiting for you to run. Call the cops. I wouldn't. You know I wouldn't. I've never even thought of it. Not since... Not since yesterday? Well, you thought of it plenty then, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes. No. No. Mm. Oh, Harry. Now you're laughing because you figure you can get rid of me. No, no, no. No, no. You're right. Don't kid yourself. I figured out the whole thing. I got us in the clear. And now you want to mess it oh. up. What are you going to do to me? You're going to... You... Oh, I don't know. It depends, baby. Depends on whether you can keep your mouth shut. Why did we do it? Why did we kill him? You wanted the money. No, no, you don't understand. I wanted to get away from him, and I wanted you. But I'm not away. All right, Marcy, all right. But we did it, and now we've got to follow it through. You didn't want me without the money. You didn't want me at all. Just the money. You don't love me. It happens I do. That's something you can't understand, huh? I've tried to make you believe me, and... And something like this comes up, and I'm I'm afraid of you. I, I keep remembering that if you want to, you can send me to the chair. Hurry, I wouldn't. I could never hurt you. Don't worry. You won't. I'm going to watch and see that you don't. Now you better get back to sleep. The next day, he didn't talk to me at all. He didn't say a word. We just sat around the house, and I felt ugly. I prayed I... I'd suddenly be beautiful because then he'd trust me. And he'd know that I wouldn't hurt him. It was after lunch that he went into the kitchen. I wanted to watch him now just as he was watching me. I couldn't bear to have him out of my sight. Supposing he went out the back door, around the front, and crept up quietly behind me. I got up. Stood behind the dining room door, looking through the crack. He was taking down a vial from the closet where he kept his photographic things. I couldn't see a label, but I knew what it was. He put the vial in his jacket pocket and closed the closet. I was going to be murdered with cyanide the way you were, Grandfather. You stay here and keep quiet. I'll answer the door. I don't want to hear a sound out of you. Good afternoon, sir. I'm your Daily Times delivery boy, and I've come to welcome you into our community. Yes, yeah, you're okay some other time, huh? As a service to you so that you may keep abreast of world events, your newspaper, the Daily Times... Now, look, buddy, we don't need a paper. Go peddle them somewhere else. Please call someone. Tell the police Sorry, that I... kid, we're not interested. Shut, shut up, shut up. <laughs> now, get back in the living room. I should have known that... Oh, you crazy... I ought to kill you for trying that. I ought to kill you. Kill. Kill me. That's what he's going to do. I had to get away or use the phone. Call the police. I needed you, Grandfather. I needed you to help me. He walked slowly back into the living room and took off his jacket. I thought how funny it was. Just like a man before a fight. Perhaps he thought I'd fight with him to save my life. What is it like to die, Grandfather? I used to ask you that when I was little. When Dad died hot in here. I'm going to have a drink. I fixed the phone so you can forget that. I'll only be in the kitchen so I can hear you. Don't try anything. Now he was going to use it for cyanide. He hadn't taken it out of his jacket pocket. It was still there. I knew it was. I heard him open the refrigerator and get out spice. I didn't even have to get up. I could reach his jacket from where I sat. I was very careful used my handkerchief to get the vial out. I'd learned about fingerprints during the trial. I knew just how much to put in a drink so that it wouldn't taste. Harry had taught me that. I was reaching for the cork in the whiskey bottle when I heard him coming back. I got the ice. He hadn't seen me. He hadn't. I took the cork out of the whiskey bottle. 
and emptied the vial of cyanide into it. That was all. It was done. I was sitting in my chair when Harry came back with the ice. What's the matter with you? Nothing. You're sick? No, 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 I'm all right. Well, you, you don't look all right. You better have a drink. I, I don't want any. No, you better. We got to talk. Here you are. This will fix you up. Drink it straight. Here. No, no, Harry. I don't want it. I, I can't stand the taste of it, please. Now, there you go again. You're getting hysterical. Oh, come on, this will settle you down. No, no, I won't. I won't. It'll let go of me. It'll make me sick. Please, Harry, don't make me. Here. Harry, you know I never drink. Harry, I don't want it. It won't kill you. No. Would you rather have me slap you around? Now, cut it out. Drink it. No. Come on, Harry, drink Harry, it. Harry, no. Look, 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 Harry. <laughs> There was a terrible burning grandfather. I tried to fight, but I couldn't. And I saw Harry fade away further and further until he was miles above me, leaning down and calling to me. I can see his face, so frightened. Then there was nothing. It's very quiet, except for the swing. Quiet, quiet. You won't let me fall, will you? I can't see you, but you're there. Hold my hand, Grandfather. I don't want to be alone. She's gone. I'm surprised she held on so long. Cyanide cases are usually faster. Cyanide? Hey, wait a minute. No I'm telling. Going. Okay, come on, Stracker. We're going downtown. Well, what are you talking about, cyanide? What do you mean? I Didn't never... did you know? There was an empty bottle in your jacket pocket. Your print's all over it. On the glass she drank from, too. Well, yeah, sure they are. She, she was having hysterics, so I, I made a drink from it. Cyanide never cured hysterics, Harry. Oh, look, I didn't do it. Listen, I didn't kill her. Like you didn't have anything to do with her grandfather's murder, I know. What was the matter? She threatened to talk? I didn't do it, I tell you, I didn't. Okay, so you didn't do it. Come on. Now, look, don't you understand? I put that cyanide in my pocket because I was afraid that she'd use it on me. I wasn't going to kill her. I, I, I was just trying to quiet her down. Brother, when you quiet them down, they stay quiet. Let's go. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Miss Rosalind Russell. Friends, this is Harlow Wilcox again to remind you that Autolite is the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. In 28 plants from coast to coast, Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, boats, and tractors, including Autolite original factory parts. Sold by authorized Autolite service stations, car dealers, garages, or repair shops. Only Autolite original factory parts can assure you of the balance and perfect timing that were originally built into your car's Autolite electrical system right on the assembly line. So, when repair needed, be sure to specify Autolite original factory parts, because you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, our stars will be Phil Harris and Alice Fay in Death on My Hands. 
And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Charles Boyer, Jeff Chandler, and Dick Powell. All on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawack and conducted by Lud Gluskin. When the Bow Breaks was written for Suspense by Anthony Ellis, from a story by Sheldon Leonard, who was heard as Harry. Others in tonight's cast were Joseph Kearns, Barney Phillips, and Jeffrey Silver. And remember, next week on Suspense... Phil Harris and Alice Fay in a tale we call Death on My Hand. Children afflicted with cerebral palsy have been given new hope through the study and solution of their problems. United Cerebral Palsy is now making its appeal for funds to fight this crippler. Mail your contribution to Palsy, 50 West 57th Street, New York 19, New York. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sponsored by the E.I. DuPont Dinamores and Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Him from the Night, starring Rosalind Russell, and as Cavalcade's host, Walter Houston. Before we begin our play tonight, here is a fall suggestion for you. Now that vacations are over and the children back in school, it's a good time to redecorate. And this fall, your home decorating can be done so easily with DuPont's Speed Easy Wall Finish. The wall finish that covers most wall surfaces with one easy coat. It's ideal over old discolored wallpaper. For less than $3, you can make the average room bright and new again. Remember, it's speedy. It dries in one hour. And it's easy. Easy for anyone to use. It's Speed Easy, made by DuPont. And now I take pleasure in presenting your host for the Cavalcade of America, Walter Houston. Good evening. Tonight, the Cavalcade of America inaugurates its tenth season with a notable series of radio plays, which I believe will provide you, Cavalcade's audience, with the finest possible in radio entertainment. The DuPont Company invited me to be your host for this series, and I was glad to accept to be able to add what I can to your enjoyment of the play's plan. There will be plays of yesterday and of today, of men and women celebrated and little known of heroes, scientists, adventurers, yet all real people brought to you from that endless living pageant which we here call the Cavalcade of America. Tonight you will hear one of your favorite players, and mine as well, Miss Rosalind Russell, as Julia Ward Howe, in a play entitled Him from the Night. And in the weeks ahead you will listen to such plays as Valley Forge, written by the distinguished playwright Maxwell Anderson, or to The Girl Lincoln Loved, written by Norman Corwin. And starred in these fine plays will be such actors as Bob Hope, Walter Pigeon, Edwin G. Robertson, Jerry Colonna, Francis Langford, Clark Gable, and other notables of the theater and motion pictures. Today, our nation, foremost among three nations, is proudly discovering and recording its present and its past. I think this radio series will prove to be a fine contribution to such a record. And now, tonight's cavalcade play, 
Him from the Night. Written by Robert Tallman and starring Miss Rosalind Russell as Julia Ward Howe. Our story is about a woman and a song. To become a battle cry of wrath. A battle cry of freedom. In the bloodiest war the new world had known. The American war between the states. <laughs> Boston, Massachusetts, peacetime. The year, 1856. Come on, boys. He's headed for the common. If he doesn't stop this time, shoot to kill. Is a posse after a band of outlaws? No. These are a United States Marshal and his deputies chasing an elderly Negro waiter through the streets of Boston, Massachusetts. They are enforcing the law of the land, the fugitive slave law. But the old, serene way of life still goes on in Boston. And in houses like that one, for instance, that proud mansion surrounded by ancient and beautiful oaks, there's a lamp burning in the parlor window. And a genteel lady sits at the piano. Julia? Jeff. Oh, I didn't hear you come in. Have you heard the news, Julia? Why, no. What happened? There was rioting. Mobs in the street. Rioting? What about? The fugitive slave law. The people of Boston aren't going to stand for it. Oh, I was afraid of this. And that's not all. If the slave states continue trying to impose their rotten system on states that don't want it, we'll carry the fight to their own territory. Chev, I never heard you talk like this before. And but what will I have done to help Julia? Well, what will I leave behind me but a few mediocre poems? Well, Dr. Holmes doesn't think your poems are mediocre. He was saying only this evening... He considered you one of the finest poets writing in America today. These are sterile times for writers, Chev. Somehow, nothing we do seems equal to the problems around us. And so we do nothing. Julia, there was a man at Dr. Holmes who talked in a way that made me wonder. That man took a sword in his hand and went out and cut down the enemy. He did something. John Brown. You met John Brown. Then it's true he is in Boston. I want to meet him, Chev. You must arrange it. No. No, you mustn't meet that old man, Julia. But why not? Well, for one thing, he's an outlaw. However much you may admire his courage, he's still a murderer, Julia. Remember the psalm, Chev? I break the jaws of the wicked and plucked out their teeth. Was that man a murderer? Those were violent times. And these are violent times, too. They were shooting today in the streets of this peaceful city. You said it yourself. It's come at last, Chev, to us, here in our little quiet lives. Come in. I stopped by to see if you'd need me this evening, ma'am. Well, I don't think you should leave the house after dark like this, Agnes. Well, nothing happened to me, ma'am. I got my three papers right here in my apron pocket. Anybody tries to get them away from me is going to have a fight on their hands. <laughs> well, all right, Agnes. But do be careful. I'll hurry right back, ma'am. And don't you go opening the doors to no strangers. <laughs> I won't. Agnes? Agnes? Agnes, are you up there? She's already gone. Oh, dear. Who is it? It's I, John Brown, servant of the Lord God, Jehovah. John Brown. You, you did say... I was bidden to come to this house, madam. I am John Brown. Oh, well, uh... Dr. Howe isn't at home just now. Perhaps it was God's will that I should speak to you, madam. Oh, well, uh, come in, Mr. Brown. I thank you, madam. I'm afraid I can't offer you much hospitality. I'm here all alone this evening. Uh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. I, uh, I've heard so much about the great work you are doing in the cause of abolishing slavery, Mr. Brown. I am only the instrument of God's will, madam. Much blood will be spilt before the sins of slavery shall be washed away. 
I pray that is not so, Mr. Brown. Pray that God's will be done, madam. And work, work in God's vineyard. This much at least you can do. Look at these hands, Mr. Brown. Are these hands of such a worker? If it is God's will, then they shall be. I am a writer, Mr. Brown. Oh, not a writer of great cadences and majestic prophecies such as your work demands. Poems. Some that I am a little proud of. Words. Uh, words have won great battles, madam. Not my kind of words. I see that you are a great lover of life, madam. I. I'm old. The arms of death are closing around me. I leave much behind me. God's work unfinished. If I could make you see your work as God has given me to see it. What is it? What do you want me to see? Glory. Glory beyond this corporeal frame. Mine eyes have seen it, madam. It is God's will that you too shall see it when the time comes. The day of wrath are at hand. Blood and blood alone will wash out the sins of slavery. Mr. Brown, your words disturb me profoundly. I pray that when you leave this house that these disturbing thoughts will go with you. And yet I fear, I know in my heart, that they will remain there forever. <laughs> Peace time, the year 1856. In Washington, on the floor of the United States Senate, Representative Brooks of South Carolina approaches the desk of Charles Sumner, senior senator from Massachusetts. Senator Sumner, sir. Hmm? Oh, Mr. Brooks. Come back later, will you? I have to finish with this. And then we can talk. Words cannot express the message I have for you, Sumner. But I believe the head of this cane will serve. Brooks, you must be Brooks. John Brown was right, Chev. The day of wrath is at hand. Words can't turn the tide of anger back. Not anymore. There's still hope, Julia. Not all the southern leaders are as violent as Brooks. You can't fight a thing like slavery with words. Senator Sumner fought with words. They silenced him with a club. John Brown uses words, too, but he backs them up with a saber. A man like that speaks even from the grave. You mustn't see that old man again, Julia. He's wild. He, he's bad for people. Promise me you won't see him again. I don't think I shall see him again, Chef. Uh, maybe we should take a little vacation. Go far away from here. Some place away from all this war talk. What do you say to that, Julia? Hmm? No, Chef. There's no use trying to turn our backs on history. Sooner or later, it'll catch up with us. The days march on, my dear. The days of wrath. There's nobody now, not even that wild old man with the strength to call retreat. John Brown, you have been found guilty of treason, conspiring with the slaves to rebel, and of murder in the first degree. Have you anything to say why sentence should not be pronounced upon you? This is the account in The Traveler. I wanted to read to you, Chef. Yes? Brown then rose and faced the courtroom. I have, he said, may it please the court, a few words to say. Had I interfered in a manner which I admit has been fairly proved, had I so interfered in behalf of the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, or in behalf of any of their friends, and suffered and sacrificed what I have in this interference, it would have been deemed all right. But because I did what I have done in the name of those who are helpless and oppressed, it has been called by another name. Well, it's over now. 
The old man made a heroic stand. But violence, bloodshed, that's not the way. I wonder how his wife took the news. She lost three sons in Kansas the same way. This is only one more tragedy in a life full of tragedies. She'll be all right. Well, I'm going to make sure she's all right. I'm going to see her. Today. But you've never even met her, Julia. We have at least one friend in common, Chev. John Brown. John Brown is dead, Julia. You must put all these things out of your mind. You can't help that old woman. And Brown himself is beyond anyone's power to help. I know, Chev. You're absolutely right. I wish I could forget the whole thing. But it's as if a voice was speaking inside of me, telling me I must remember. Remember things I, I never even knew. Julia, I'm a dull sort of fellow when it comes to understanding what goes on inside a poet's mind. Even if the poet happens to be my wife. But I do know something about what makes people become ill. And I tell you, your health won't hold up under this mental strain. Then so be it. When John Brown left this house, he left me with a feeling of destiny. Something I must do, something I must see. I don't even know what it is. But I shall never rest again until I find out. You are listening to Rosalind Russell in Hymn from the Night on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the E.I. DuPont Dinamours and Company of Wilmington, Delaware, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Once again, here is Cavalcade's host, Walter Houston. Peacetime in the year 1859. The American nation lies in the path of storm, and Americans, north and south, troubled, fearful, prepare to meet disaster. In the quiet city of Boston, Julia Ward Howe has tried to shut out of the peaceful lives of herself and her family the growing terror and alarm. But the burning memory of a wrathful man disturbs her. The memory of John Brown. She seeks out his widow for some word that may put her troubled mind at ease. Morning, ma'am. Good morning. You're Mrs. John Brown, aren't you? Yes. I'm Julia Howe. I met your husband. Oh, I... you're one of them. I don't understand. Why don't you leave me alone? Haven't you cost me enough grief? You and all the others giving him money, egging him on to his death, and now denying you ever know him. I'm not one of them, Mrs. Brown. Believe me, I'm not. Well, what do you want of me? May I come in and, and talk to you for just a moment? I ain't one to turn a stranger away from my door, Miss Howe. Thank you. Perhaps you'd rather not talk about your husband, Mrs. Brown. I, I know this must have been a terrible shock to you. Well, it didn't hurt so much losing him as it did hearing about the shame they heaped on him before they strung him up. He was a mighty proud man, Miss Howe. Yes, I know. He'd seen the glory for certain. There was no doubt of that, ma'am. Well, I recollect the day he come running in from the fields with that that terrible look in his eyes. Mine eyes have seen it, he says to me. Glory beyond this corporeal frame. Yes. Yes, that was it. He told you about it, ma'am? Well, yes, in a way. Tell me, did he ever mention meeting me? Yes. What did he say? Well, I'd... Rather not say, ma'am. Don't go ahead. I... I must know. Well, he says... There's a woman... Knows how to use words. Pity she... Don't see things more clear. Oh. Well, I, uh... I won't keep you any longer, Mrs. Brown. If there's anything I can do to help... Anything. Just... Just keep your eyes open, Miss Howe. It's a blind in spirit does the most harm in the world. When you see things clearly the way my John wanted you to, you'll be able to do something for me. 
And all the folks like me. I, Abraham Lincoln, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will to the best of my ability. That the sovereign state of South Carolina and legislature assembled does hereby declare an act of secession from the United States of America and here and That the said states, states, together with their militias, armed forces, and civil officers, are declared to be in a state of rebellion against the United States of America. Yes, Julia? Take me to Washington with you. Well, I'd like to take you, Julia. You don't seem to realize it's practically a battlefront. I'm not afraid, Chev. Well, Julia... Oh, you, uh, you really mustn't worry so much about me, my dear. If I've seemed out of sorts lately, it's not because I'm ill or unhappy. It's just that my eyes have been straining to see. To see what that old man saw. The things that lifted him up and made him strong. John Brown. That song, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. The soldiers singing it now as they march off to war. There's no escaping him. No, Chef. There's no escaping John Brown. <laughs> Is that you, Julia? Yes, Chef, it's I. No, don't bother to light the gas. Enough light comes through the windows to undress by. Ah, I just dropped off to sleep. Those cannon across the river keep up such a thunder. What kept you so long? I went to Soldiers Hospital to see Louisa Alcott. Oh, Louisa May? I didn't know she was in Washington. She volunteered as a nurse. And think of it. Poor, shy little Louisa. Never away from home before. Facing the horrors of that place. How does she seem to be getting along? I didn't see her. Oh, I thought you said I that went you... to the hospital. They told me what happened. Her father came to take her home this morning. Well, what did happen? There was a soldier there in the ward. He was in great pain. She was reading aloud to him. And he would clutch her hand in his spasms of pain. Finally, when he finally dozed off, she couldn't get her hand free. They found her there this morning. They had to break the dead man's fingers to loosen the grip on her hand. Julia, we leave Washington tomorrow. That's final. Very well. I think I've seen what I came to see. Good. Come on to bed. You must be tired. Oh, I think I'll sit here by the window for a few minutes. Ah, the breeze feels good. Uh, all right. Dr. Parker drove me over the long bridge to one of the convalescent camps. They were singing that song. Mm-hmm. The spirit of those men, ready to go back and face death, some of them for the third or fourth time. It made you feel that this wasn't any small, ugly anger but a real, big, clean, righteous wrath. It made you feel how inadequate words are to express a thing like that. And they need words. Words as big as the fighting spirit of the man they sing about. Chef, are you listening? Are you asleep? Here they come now. More of them. The army of the wounded... The faces. I can see their faces so clearly as the wagons pass beneath the gaslight there. I think I'd know every one of them if I were to see them another time. Another place. Yes. I see things so clearly now. Is this what you wanted me to see, John Brown? Was this the word? Beyond this corporeal frame, 
Mine eyes have seen it, madam. Mine eyes. Mine eyes. Mine eyes. Now. Now I remember what I never knew. Mine eyes. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. He hath sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Rosalind Russell. And may I say as Cavalcade's host, and for myself as well, Rosalind, thank you for a magnificent performance. The last page of our program tonight contains exciting and interesting news about many of your Hollywood favorites. I'll be back in a few moments to tell you about it. Meanwhile, here's Gain Whitman with an interesting story about the new use for nylon. Thank you, Walter Houston. In the year 3000, school children may hear something like this in their classes. As late as the 20th century, children, our ancestors didn't know how to make many of the materials they needed. They had to use materials taken directly from mines of the earth, from plants and animals. But the 20th century brought about a great change which made possible the world we live in today. Then chemists began on a large scale to create new materials designed for just the purpose for which they were needed. The story of paintbrushes in the war illustrates what the school teacher of the year 3000 may tell her pupils. When our Navy took on the colossal task of building the greatest war fleet in history, one of the thousands of difficulties Navy men had to overcome was paintbrushes. A small thing, yes, even a trivial thing. But every battleship calls for a thousand pounds of paint, and the paintbrushes just had to be gotten somewhere, and fast. Bristles for paintbrushes had always come from the half-wild hogs of North China and Russia. No other material had been found that was as good for the purpose. But today, thousands of new Navy ships and craft of all kinds are painted with nylon bristle brushes. Not the fine multifilament nylon yarn that goes into stockings, but large monofills of nylon tapered at the ends by a special DuPont process. In addition, several hundred test brushes have been used by master painters on all kinds of severe surfaces, including wood, steel, and concrete. The results show that the nylon bristles wear at least three times longer than natural bristles. They are unaffected by cold water paints and can be cleaned by any commercial solvent cleaner. And they are not attacked by moths or other vermin. The Navy wanted brushes with tapered synthetic bristles. Chemists, in cooperation with brush manufacturers, have supplied more than a million brushes thus far. Today, nylon bristled brushes are available only for war purposes. After the war, they will be among the many new materials tailor-made to fit your exact needs. A contribution of the chemistry of the future. The kind of chemistry that brings you the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. And now, here is Walter Houston. On the battlefront of the world tonight, thousands of human hearts are still beating because of a man most of us never heard of. He was Dr. Norman Bethune, who first created the Mobile Field Blood Bank. His story, which Cavalcade presents next week, is high drama. The story of a scientist fighting a battle for the betterment of his fellow men. One of the screen's finest players, Walter Pigeon, will portray the role of Dr. Bethune. And in weeks to come, our schedule is filled with exciting dramas. With the most famous of Hollywood stars, Edward G. Robinson, Bob Hope, 
Jerry Colonna, Francis Langford, Clark Gable, and many others. I know you will enjoy every one of them. Thank you. Rosalind Russell, star of tonight's performance, may soon be seen in the Warner Brothers production, Roughly Speaking. Remember, next Monday, Lifetide, starring Walter Pigeon and with Walter Houston as host. Brought to you on the Cavalcade of America by E.I. DuPont, Dinamores and Company of Wilmington, Delaware. For Better Living Through Chemistry presents Rosalind Russell on the Cavalcade of America. And here's our star, Rosalind Russell. My husband was innocent of any crime, yet he was seized and thrown into prison. I devoted myself to his freedom, and perhaps to the freedom of every citizen in the American colonies. My name is Anna Zenga. Time, the year 1735. Place, Philadelphia, in the home of Mr. Andrew Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton, I have traveled by carriage all the way from New York. I must speak to you on a matter of urgency. Oh, my dear madam, I fear you're an error. I'm a barrister, not a physician. Yes, yes, I know. Moreover, I'm past 80 years of age, rendered infirm by gout, plagued by my relations, and... Oh, please, Mr. Hamilton. There is a man in in prison in New York. I shouldn't be surprised. He is innocent of any crime, sir. No doubt, if you say so. The name of the man is John Peter Zenger. My husband, sir. His crime, madam? He is accused of libel and slander. He is publisher of the New York Weekly Journal. His offense was he printed the truth about a scoundrel. And the name of the scoundrel? His Majesty's Governor of New York Province, Colonel William Cosby. Well, your husband is either an extraordinary fool or a very brave man. Well, he printed no slander. He printed no libel. Every word against the governor was a true word. The governor of New York Colony is corrupt and arrogant... Oh, it is truth and not sedition to say so. Yeah, hear your fatigue, Mrs. Anger. Pray be seated. Mr. Hamilton, I must say this to you. My husband could obtain his freedom tomorrow. Yes? He has only to, to name the author of the attack on His Excellency the Governor. Well? John printed the words. He did not write them. I wrote them. Mm. <clears throat> well, do go on. John has been silent and in prison for eight months. He protects me. If there is a criminal, Mr. Hamilton, I am that criminal. Mrs. Anger, there are capable lawyers in New York. Sir, I implore you. In all the American colonies, there is no lawyer with greater reputation than Andrew Hamilton of Philadelphia. I implore you. Come to New York. I shall require all the facts. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Now, please begin. I shall not interrupt you. When I married John Zanger, my family was greatly disappointed. He was immensely tall and immensely strong. And my family conceded that he was a handsome man. But we were early settlers. And John Zanger was an immigrant from Germany. Moreover, he was employed by Mr. Bradford, the printer. Whereupon they accounted him no gentleman. Anna, what do you see in me? You. There is... There is too much difference between us. Well, I'm told that difference is customary. You are a man, I am a woman. That's usually so. I'm not clever, Anna. Don't joke with me. I love you, John. 
Tell me why. Look at my hands. Look at my clumsy feet. Listen to my voice. It is a voice fit to great a vegetable. Still, it will serve to propose a marriage. When I was a boy in Germany, I used to dream of someone like you. If you will stay here, I will go inside and speak with your father. We were married, and at the urging of... Well, my urging, John set up his own modest print shop. Those were good days. We prospered, our children were born... We were content. And then His Majesty appointed a new governor. We became aware of the change the day Judge Morris came to the print shop. How soon will it be printed? In two days, Judge Morris. You do fine work, John. Thank you, Judge. I will send it to your chambers in the courthouse. Send it by wagon to my residence in Westchester. But the courthouse is only a short distance. I am no longer a judge. Oh, have you resigned, sir? I have been removed. By whom? By His Excellency, Governor Crosby. Judge Morris... I'm afraid we don't understand. It's quite simple. A point of law came before me. I delivered an opinion which was not pleasing to the governor. I was removed from office. Oh. Well, who knows about it, sir? The governor and I, and now you. Perhaps all the citizens of New York should know. What would you have them know? That henceforth judges are to be intimidated. And how would you tell them? Well... By printing the information in handbills. My dear Anna, you have a husband. You have a family. With this governor, independence of spirit is a liability. Good afternoon to you both. Morning, friend. I said good morning. John Zenger, printer. Ten shillings and sixpence, please. I'm afraid I don't understand. I'm the new tax collector. Ten shillings and sixpence. Well, there is some mistake. Anna! What is it? The tax collector's here. I paid it last week. Five shillings. You see? There has been some error. No error. This is a new tax. The assembly has passed a new tax. This is a new tax uh, decreed by the governor. Why was it not announced by the town crier? I announced it. Ten shillings and sixpence. That will be the second levy in one month. Oh, haven't you heard, John? The governor is a poor man. I am on King's business. I admonish you to guard your tongue. This is my shop. Get out. John. Get out before I carry John, you John, let me talk to him, please. There is nothing more to say. John Zinger, you have delivered a threat against the King's messenger. It will be noted. <laughs> Look, Anna, it is not for a woman. Keep your eyes down, Anna. Tell me what is happening. Can't you guess? Yes. We are governed by William Cosby. I can guess. How many are there? Three. One in the pillory. The other poor devil tied to the whipping post. And the third? John, you said there were three. My eyes are closed. But I will tell you. The pillory... The whipping post. And also the hangman's yard, with the noose and the rope ready and adjusted for service. Why do I stand here, Anna? I am strong. I have fists. I can use Wait a minute, John. What will that accomplish? There are only two soldiers. I can use my hands against them. The sheriff will send two more men. He will send ten men, fifty men. John, there are better ways of dealing with the governor. Yes. Sabres and pistols. Words are better. They cut deeper. Words that can be printed... Words that can be read by every citizen of New York City. John, you are a printer. Print what the people have the right to know. But Anna, I... I have no skill with words. I could write the words. And you could print them. Don't you see, John? We can do it together. We can have a newspaper. <laughs> We called our newspaper the New York Weekly Journal. And, Mr. Hamilton, for the sake of our children, it was understood that no one was to know that Anna Zenger was other than a housewife and a mother. <laughs> My housewifely duties became exceedingly strange. May I look over your shoulder while you work? <laughs> if you wish. Why is there no accounting to the people by the governor 
as to how tax monies are spent. Why is it permitted by the freeholders of New York province that the governor convene the assembly at his pleasure and dissolve the assembly at his pleasure? Anna. Come. Set up the type, John. I will help you lock it in the press. Anna. Yes? You make me ashamed for myself. Why? I am a lump. Two fists like hands. And no mind. And no culture. Governor Cosby has culture. He puts it on like a coat and wears it at public executions. No coat of culture on your back, perhaps. Nothing to get threadbare. But, John, the things that are yours are things inside. They don't wear out. Anna, we play with fire, you and I. Whatever happens, you must know that I love you. This, I take it, is the Zenger print shop? How do you do? Oh, I do exceedingly well, madam. My, my husband will return in a moment. Then let us not hasten the moment. <laughs> you are quite charming when you blush. Who are you? An admirer. Well, what do you wish here, sir? Your husband is the most fortunate of men. It would be a pity if he ceased to be a man. You speak in riddles. A man in prison is buried. Ergo, he is no longer a man. Oh. You come from the governor. I do, madam. My dear Mrs. Enger, I come to warn your husband that several matters taken up in the columns of his newspaper are in poor taste. That it must be the truth is in poor taste? Yes, madam. But I am quite sure that my husband will freely open his columns to you or to the governor for reply or rebuttal. Very friendly of you. But we shall not engage in controversy. Nor will you. Nor will your husband. I thank you for speaking more plainly. I shall hasten to the governor's mansion and report that certain indiscretions will not recur in the future. My compliments, Mrs. Zenger. That you, John? Have you finished yet? Nearly. I have spoken with Morris. He promises that if there is trouble, he will defend me. Will he defend me, too? There will be no need of that, Anna. Your name will appear nowhere in the journal. You're a wife and a mother. You have nothing to do with the New York Weekly Journal. Then perhaps you should hear what I've written. Listen. Under the administration of Governor Cosby, we see men's deeds destroyed. Judges arbitrarily displaced. Trials by juries taken away. Who is there in the province that can call anything his own or enjoy any liberty save those permitted by the administration? John, I have signed my name to it. Anna Zenger. Anna, you cannot... We are husband and wife. I shall not allow you to be punished for what I write. We struck a bargain. You may not break it. There is no longer a matter of you or me. There is nothing personal in this. Now it is larger than us. A bargain is a bargain. Scratch your name out. It was a bad bargain. You will not jeopardize yourself. If you do not scratch your name out, I set no type. The journal will not be printed. John! Scratch your name out. Just now, you said this was larger than us. It was just talk, then. Scratch your name out, or there is no publication. I mean what I say. I will melt the type. Scratch your name out. Thank you. If they arrest me, Morris will be able to find someone to set type. But if they put you in prison, Anna, the journal would die. I think I would die also. My dear Harrison, have you read this issue of the Wheatley Journal? Unfortunately, I have, Your Excellency. Of course, you realize you've been a bungling fool... You told me these attacks against me would cease. Well, I had every reason, sir, to believe... You gave me your assurance. Well, it was my impression that... What can I say, Your Excellency? Nothing. Therefore, I have the grace to be still. Bradley, coming, sir. You called, Governor. What did you think I did? Where is the indictment? Your Excellency, a grand jury indicts. That is English law. 
We shall assist the grand jury. I have been aspersed. My administration has been vilified. Seditious libels have been spread abroad concerning me. Harrison, the journal must cease publication. I understand fully, Your Excellency. Make sure you don't botch it again. Now get out. Both of you. You are listening to The Cavalcade of America, starring Rosalind Russell, and presented by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. In Philadelphia, a desperate Anna Zenger relates to Andrew Hamilton the events which brought about the imprisonment of John Peter Zenger. It came, Mr. Hamilton. It was inevitable. We thought we were safe, for John was well known now. The weekly journal was eagerly read, not only in New York province, but everywhere. It gave us a sense of security that was false. Nearly nine months ago, on a peaceful Sabbath day, they seized him and threw him into jail. This court is acting illegally in refusing the right of trial to John Peter Zenger. What you have done is abhorrent to the spirit of the English common law. Are you finished, Counselor? I am, Your Honor. I am not, Your Honor. Resume your place, madam. I wish to be heard. Why does this court refuse to issue a writ of habeas corpus? Madam? I have a right to speak. The issue is law. Madam? The issue is the right of free men to speak freely, to assemble freely, to publish their writings freely. Madam? The issue is the right of the people to read the truth. Not Governor Cosby's truth. God's truth that men are free men and sacred in God's eyes. This court chooses to ignore your intemperate outburst, madam. You are a woman. You cannot know better being unaccustomed to our usages. But you, counselor, you do know better. Therefore, it is the judgment of this court that you be disbarred from the practice of law. You have ten minutes with the prisoner, no more. John? Anna, is that you? Yes, John. They lack even the ordinary humanity to unlock a prison door for ten minutes. No matter. If you will... How thin your hands have become. Never mind now. This is good. We are fighting for you every moment. I know, I know. The journal comes out each week. The governor is mystified. That's amusing, isn't it? John, I said it was amusing. Anna, who are we to challenge a world? Oh, don't talk like that, darling. We can't go back now. I have spent eight months in the cell. It is my caution. No. Four feet by eight feet. I step two paces lengthwise, one pace sidewise. Two lengthwise, one sidewise. Two lengthwise. The people... I'm proud of you, John. The weekly journal is now being read from Boston to Charleston. Newspapers throughout the colonies reproduce our story of your imprisonment. Oh, there is a great lawyer in Philadelphia. The governor cannot... Well, he cannot delay the trial any longer. Not beyond next month. Andrew Hamilton will defend you. It is hopeless. You waste your time. Nothing is hopeless. Except death. I am going to Philadelphia... And so, Mr. Hamilton, you have become John Zenger's last hope and my last hope. Governor Cosby and his judges will not dare to do to you, to Andrew Hamilton, what they have dared against others. I know that you are entitled to spend your final days in peace. But forgive me, sir. I had no one else to come to. Don't mention it again, my dear. For the first time on this new continent, there's been created a large issue. The freedom of the press. It will lead to larger issues. I'm not too old to say a word about that. Come, madam. We leave for New York. You may 
resume, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. I call Anna Zenga once again. Put your hand down, my dear. You've already taken the oath once. Anna Zenga, I show you a copy of the New York Weekly Journal. You recognize it? I do. There's a section marked on the first page. Will you tell the jury who put that mark there? I did. For what purpose, madam? Because I believe that these words are the essence of the defense. You may read, Anna Zenger. It is charged that John Peter Zenger has committed false, scandalous, and seditious libels against Governor William Cosby. We assert that if you can prove that what a man prints is true, no libel is committed. Mr. Hamilton, the witness is a witness. Not defense counsel addressing the jury. I am reading from the weekly journal, Your Honor. Do not address this court, madam. I address the jury, Your Honor. Madam. I say to them that the mere printing and publishing of statements in a newspaper is not a crime. Madam, that is enough. Not nearly enough, Your Honor. It is falsehood which makes libel and scandal, not truth. Mr. Hamilton, correct your witness. Not at all, Your Honor. I thought the lady acquitted herself rather well. (laughs) Mr. Hamilton, I warn you... I no longer address the court. The case is clear. I address you, members of the jury. The issue is freedom of the press. Granted by your verdict and all other freedoms will flow from it. You are 12 honest and lawful men. In you lies our safety. Our safety against governors who injure and provoke the people to cry out and complain and then make that very complaint the foundation for new oppressions and prosecutions. Gentlemen of the jury, in your hands is the guarantee of our liberty. Is the jury ready? We are, Your Honor. John Zenger. Yes, Your Honor. You will stand and face the jury. Yes, Your Honor. Gentlemen of the jury, are you agreed upon a verdict? We are agreed. Do you agree that John Peter Zenger is guilty of printing and publishing the libels as charged? We have agreed that John Peter Zenger is not guilty. Zenger, my warmest congratulations. This is your day. My day. Mr. Hamilton, I would still be in prison, but for you. And I, too. You, Anna? Mr. Hamilton, when John was seized, I thought that only John Peter Zenger was in prison. I was wrong. We were all imprisoned. And now that you have freed him... You have freed us all. You have reminded the court that the Bible on which I took my oath declares, proclaim liberty throughout all the land and unto all the inhabitants thereof. Rosalind Russell will return in a moment. Now here with a brief message for every listener is Cavalcade star Rosalind Russell. Just to remind you to open your door wide when a red feather volunteer calls and open your heart too. Support all the Red Feather services through your hometown community chest. Thank you, and goodbye. Tonight's 
Cavalcade play is an original radio drama by Morton Wishingrad, suggested by the novelized biography Anna Zenger by Kent Cooper, published by Farrar and Strauss. The director, John Zoller. The music composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Borries. Featured in the cast with Miss Russell was Peter Cattell as John Zenger. Rosalind Russell is currently starring in the Columbia picture, Tell It to the Judge. This is Ted Pearson speaking. We invite you to tune in next week when Cavalcade will bring you the popular Hollywood star, Dane Clark, in Lifeline, the true story of enterprising Bob Forrest of Port Angeles, Washington, who found adventure and a career deep down on the ocean floor. On the following Tuesday, Cavalcade will present for his first radio appearance after his return from abroad, Tyrone Power. Following that, Cary Grant, Ray Milland, and others. The best stars and the best stories of America and her people. And don't forget next week, Dane Clark on the Cavalcade of America. Cavalcade of America comes to you from the stage of the Velasco Theater in New York and is presented by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Listen to Me and Janie, which follows immediately on NBC. And Russell, Spencer... The Gulf Screen Guild Theater... Our neighborhood good golf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies welcome you to the Gulf Theater, the one place where you meet all your favorite stars. Tonight, the Gulf Theater presents Rosalind Russell and Spencer Tracy with Oscar Bradley and his Gulf Orchestra. And now your host, the director of the Gulf Theater, Roger Pryor. <laughs> That's the last show of the season from the Gulf Theater, and we've decided to let Rosalind Russell and Spencer Tracy choose their own play. What was the decision, Roz? Ernest Lubitsch's production of Ninochka. We both think it's one of the most beautiful pictures ever to come out of Hollywood. What part are you playing, Spence? Well, I just wanted to show Melvin Douglas, who played this part so beautifully, how really badly it could have been done. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Roz? Well, I can't tell exactly, Roger, but any similarity between the character I play tonight and Greta Garbo is purely coincidental. <laughs> yes, yes. And ladies and gentlemen, if you hear a vast silence coming out of your radio, stick around. It's just Russell and Tracy trying to underplay each other. <laughs> By the way, Ernest Lubitsch is sick in bed with a cold. When he hears this, it'll get him out of bed. But quick, come on, <laughs> curtain line. <laughs> Paris in the spring of several years ago, when a siren was a woman and not an air raid alarm. Comrades Bulyanov and Kapolsky, members of the Russian Board of Trade, just arrived from Moscow to sell the confiscated jewels of the former Duchess Swana, are meeting with an obstacle in the person of Count Leon Dalgu. I'm sorry to interfere with your plans, comrades, but these jewels are the property of the Duchess Swana. They were stolen legally, monsieur. I am acting for the Duchess. Here is an injunction that says you cannot sell them. What will you settle for? Russia is invincible. But make us a proposition. <laughs> I'll settle for half of what you get for the jewels. Impossible. Not a chance. Please talk to a lawyer. All right, you talk to a lawyer and the Duchess and I will talk to the judge. He's cutting our throats. Capitalistic sabotage. <laughs> Let me remind you, gentlemen, that the Duchess Swana is a beautiful woman. And on the witness stand... You can't scare us. Boys, boys, have you ever seen a French court when a beautiful woman lifts her skirt a little? You sit down and pull up your pants and where will it get you? <laughs> I suppose you expect us to give you the jewels. So that Razina, our commissar at the Board of Trade, can send us to Siberia, eh? Oh, now don't worry, boys. I'll send him a telegram explaining everything. Why Razina can't send you to Siberia? That's what they keep telling us down at Moscow. <laughs> Yes, but people keep right on going to Siberia. Cheer up, comrades. I'll wire Razin in. And while we wait for an answer, I'll show you how to really enjoy Paris. Come, 
Comrade Yakoshova. Yes, Commissar Rosnin. I have here a report on Bulyanov and Kopalski from Secret Agent G-2W4. There have been a boring from within by a Count Leon Dalgu. You, a envoy extraordinary and unbanding pillar of the Soviet state, will take the train to Paris at once. Very well, Commissar. Not so long. This is strictly confidential. <laughs> Excuse me. I am looking for two comrades. Bulyanov and Kapowski. I am Bulyanov. I am Kapowski. And I am Nina Ivanova Yokoshova. Envoy extraordinary from Moscow. Comrade Ninochka. Oh, we did not expect the lady envoy. Kapowski, get flowers. Oh, please do not make an issue of my womanhood. We are here for work. You have engaged to vent for me? Why, yes, comrade Ninochka. At the Hotel Claret. Uh, carry your bags, madame. Why? He is a porter. He wants to carry them. Why? Why should you carry all the people's bags? Well, that's my business, madame. That's no business. That's a social injustice. <laughs> <laughs> that depends on the tip. Lead the way, please. Yes, comrade. <laughs> How are things in Moscow? Excellent. That's nice. The last mock trial were a great success. There are going to be fewer, but better Russians. <laughs> apartment, comrade Ninochka. Which part of the room is mine? Oh, in Paris. They don't rent rooms in pieces. You have the whole suite. How much does it cost? Two thousand francs a day. Two thousand francs will buy a cow. In one week, I will cost the Russian people seven cows. Who am I to cost the Russian people seven cows? <laughs> but we had to take this suite, comrade Ninochka. It has a safe for the jewels. And what has our lawyer done about the jewels? We have no lawyer. We have dealt directly with Count Leon Dalgu, representative of the Duchess Swan. Lawyers here are very expensive. We just say hello to a Paris lawyer and, well, there goes another cow. Send for this Count Leon Dalgu. I will talk with him. Yes, comrade. In the meantime, I wish to inspect the public utilities of the city. Oh, we'll be glad to show you Paris, comrade. Yes, Count Dalgu has taken us everywhere. So we have heard in Russia... It will be a pleasant memory during your long nights in Siberia. Goodbye now. I go for a walk. You, if you please. Huh? Speaking to me? How long does one have to wait on this traffic island to cross the street? Till the policeman whistles again. How many minutes between whistles? I never gave that a thought. You never took the trouble to find out? Took the trouble to find out? No. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> May I help you hold that map? Please. I am looking for the Eiffel Tower. Is that thing lost again? <laughs> Listen, if you're interested in a view... Only from a technical standpoint. Oh. Oh, well, then I'm afraid I can't help you. Parisians only go to the top of the tower in moments of despair to jump off. How long does it take a man to land? Well, the last time I jumped, I forgot to time it. <laughs> Let me see now, the Eiffel Tower. Here, here it is, right here on the map. And where are we? Right here, together. Isn't that nice? Must you flirt? <laughs> no, no, I don't have to, but I find it natural. <laughs> I'll try. As a matter of information, is your approach typical of the local morale? Mademoiselle, it is the kind of approach which has made Paris what it is. <laughs> I have always heard of the arrogant male in capitalistic society. In Russia, it is different. Oh, oh, you're a Russian. Yes, of course. Oh, I love Russians, comrade. I've been fascinated by your five-year plan for the past 15 years. <laughs> your type will soon be extinct, fortunately. Goodbye. I'm going to study the towel. Oh, fine, fine. Wait a minute. I'll come along with you. The, uh, the staircase has 829 steps, plus 254 steps to the very top. 
And that's where we are now, just in case you didn't count. Oh, beautiful. Yes. Yes, I'm glad to see it once more before becoming extinct. Look at all those lights down there. Pretty, yes. What a waste of electricity. <laughs> all Paris at your feet. The boulevards, the river Seine. Here, here, uh, step over to the telescope. You see, I put a franc in the slot, then turn the lens into... There, there, take a look. I see nothing but a house. But it's my house. Three rooms in the kitchenette. You'd like it. Do you mean you want me to go there? Please don't misunderstand me. Then you don't want me to go there. I didn't say that. Then why don't we go? Huh? <laughs> you might be an interesting subject of study. Well, I'll do my best, comrade. So, this is my castle, Dinochka. Can I, can I get you something to eat or a drink? No, thank you. I've had all the calories necessary for today. <laughs> what do we do now, comrade? Well, we sit down. We look at each other. We smile. Why? We don't smile. <laughs> Tell me, what do you do for mankind? For mankind, not a thing. For womankind, the record is not so bleak. <laughs> your general appearance is not distasteful. Thank you. Whites of your eyes are clear. Your cornea is excellent. Your cornea is terrific. <laughs> can it be I'm falling in love with you? Love, a romantic designation for the most ordinary chemical process. Ninochka. But uh, chemically, we are quite sympathetic. Ninochka, Ninochka. You repeat yourself. <laughs> I'd like to say it a thousand times, but you confuse me, Ninochka. After all, I'm only a poor bourgeois. I once belonged to the petty bourgeoisie myself. My parents wanted me to work on their farm, but I preferred the bayonet. You don't say. I was a sergeant in the 3rd Cavalry Brigade. Would you like to see where I was wounded? If it's not too much trouble. Here on my shoulder. Oh. <laughs> A Cossack Lancer when I was 16. Poor Ninach. What don't pity me, pity the Lancer. After all, I'm alive. Just what kind of a girl are you anyway? Just a tiny cog in the great wheel of evolution. You're the most adorable cog I've ever seen. Ninochka, never did I dream I could feel like this toward a sergeant. You feel... <laughs> feel like home. Ninochka. Why do doves bill and coo? Why do snails circle interminably around each other? Why do flowers open their petals? Oh, Ninochka, surely you feel some slight symptom of the divine passion. A warmth, the burning of the lips that is a thousand times more tantalizing, more exalting than thirst? You are very talkative. <laughs> I'm going to kiss you. There. Is that talkative? No, that was restful. <laughs> Again, please. Oh, darling. My barbaric Ninochka. My impossible, unromantic, statistical, glorious, analytical. Your telephone is ringing. Oh, all right. Hello? Yes? Yes, Pugliano? Pugliano? Yes. No, I, I can't come right now. I'm entertaining a friend. Yes, from the army. Yeah, wh wh what's the name of the envoy extraordinary? Oh, it's a girl. Well, what's her name? Jack, what was that? Spell it. Y-A-K-U-S-H-O-V-A. Thank you. Oh. Never mind, Bugliano. Goodbye. Denotchka. Envoy extraordinary, Yokoshova. You'll represent the Dodgers, then? Yes, but... I must go now. You, well, why not just forget the telephone ever rang? I was sent here by the commissar to fight you. So from now on, if you wish to approach me... I do. Then do it through my lawyer. Nenachka, you can't walk out like this. Remember, you, you like the white of my eyes. I must go, I tell but you. Nenachka, I held you in my arms. You kissed me. Ah, uh, yes. But I kissed the Cossack Lancer, too, before he died. <laughs> Ladies and 
and gentlemen, while we're waiting for Act Two of Ninochka, we'd like to extend an invitation to all of you. All right, Johnny. Well, folks, it's an invitation from your neighborhood good golf dealer. Your good golf dealer wants to help you with your spring cleaning. Now, naturally, he can't come around to your home and get busy with a broom or a vacuum cleaner, but he can give your car just about the grandest going over that it's ever had. So drive in tomorrow where you see the golf orange disc. Get a crankcase full of summer-grade Gulf Pride motor oil, have your transmission and differential lubricant changed, and get rid of winter squeaks by having your car completely Gulf flexed with summer lubricants, too. This month and every month, it pays to make the good Gulf dealer your dealer. Nanotchka, starring Spencer Tracy and Rosalind Russell. A week has passed since Leon discovered that Nanotchka is the envoy extraordinary, and Nanotchka learned that Leon is representing the Dutch Swana. In desperation, he's followed her to a small restaurant. Do you mind if I join you, Sergeant Yakushova? You have no right to follow me. How, how about this little table here by the window? I have nothing to say to you. Oh, no, but I've got a lot to say to you. Please, you wish to order now? A plate of raw carrots and beets. Sergeant, this is a restaurant, not a meadow. <laughs> Waiter, bring us some uh, crayfish soup, omelet with mushrooms, dessert, and coffee. We oui, must. Your tactics are very bad, Count Elgu. Oh, Ninochka. Now, look, look. Can, can, can't you just pretend that there are no jewels, no Duchess Swana, no lawsuit? You, you take things too seriously. Come on, please relax. I beg. Sergeant, smile. At what? At me, at yourself, at, 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 at that funny little bird sitting on the windowsill begging for crumbs. Mm -hmm. He is funny, isn't he? <laughs> he pops out his chest exactly like Kwame is for lasting me. <laughs> That's better. You like Paris, Nenachka? It is nice. Back home there is still snow and ice, and here flowers and birds. I have always felt a little hurt that our swallows deserted us in the winter for capitalistic countries. <laughs> now I know why. You have the high ideal, but uh, then you have the climb. <laughs> Would you like to see more of Paris, the real Paris? Yes, I believe I should. All right, we'll do the town. All the gay, romantic, beautiful places you've read about. Where would you like to go first? The waterworks. What? <laughs> and the power and light plant. But Ninochka. And the power of sewers. All right, all right, all right. Now, if I take you to the waterworks, the light plant, and the Paris sewers, will you let me pick out the other points of interest? Why not? Good, good. Come on, Comrade Ninochka. You're going to learn a lot about Paris and about life. And so, these pumps deliver 10,000 gallons of water one minute. Oh, it's marvelous. Therefore, these electric generators deliver 5,000 volts. Oh, wonderful. Our boat is now drifting down the romantic main street. Oh, sol mio. <laughs> what time is it, Leon? Why, it's only midnight. But what do you think of my part of Paris? I like it. But I should not have let you talk me into buying this place. <laughs> I don't look foolish. Foolish. Why, if I met that dress walking down the boulevard all by itself, I'd say, just a moment, you charming little dress, I want you to meet Ninochka. <laughs> you two were meant for each other. And the hat. <laughs> Is it not silly? Oh, it's a beautiful hat. Everybody in the restaurant is looking at you. There is one woman, a very beautiful one, coming toward our table and looking very angry. Leo. Oh, oh, oh hello, Swana. Oh, well. Leon, darling, this is a surprise. And, uh, who's your little friend? Oh, pardon me. Uh, your Highness Comrade Yakushova, the Duchess Swanow. Oh, really? The envoy from Russia who's here to sell the jewels they stole from me. <laughs> and what a lovely gown. Is that what they're wearing in Moscow this year? No, madame. Last year. <laughs> really? Well, uh, do see that Mademoiselle Yakushova enjoys Paris, Leon, so she can return to Moscow empty-handed. But with pleasant memories. Good night, darling. Good night, Swallow. Hmm. Now I think I need a champagne. Yes, so do I. Well, here's to us. Oh. 
This is good. Let's have more champagne. Let's have lots of champagne. In other words, let's have champagne. <laughs> Comrades, good people of France. Uh, Take it easy, take it easy. Wake up the whole hotel. I want to make a speech. I want to overthrow the Dutch Swan. (laughs) Overthrow her tomorrow. Here's the door of your suite now. Lean on me till I get it open. I love you, my little Leonichka. And I adore you, my little Leonichka. (laughs) Steady now. In we go. Leon. Yes, darling. I want to confess. I know, the Russian soul. Go ahead. Well, uh, when I kissed you, I betrayed Russia and the party. Well, how about forming a party of our own? Oh, that's a wonderful idea, Leon. Right. Lovers of the world unite. Our salute will be a kiss. Comrade, I salute you. Oh, we ought to have music for that. All right, where's the radio? Oh, the radio, right over there in the wall. Where? Open that little door. Oh, yes, yes. Turn the knob twice to the right and stop at seven. Seven. Then twice to the left and stop at seventeen. Seventeen. There we are, there we are. There we are. There's no music in this thing, only some jewels. Oh, those awful jewels again. The tears of Russia. Hmm. Who cried this big one? Peter the Great? (laughs) (laughs) Ah, look, here's a crown. I'll put it on you. No, no, please. No. See, I make you Ninochka the Great, the Grand Duchess of the Masses. Uh, Thank you, Masses. Love the world. The revolution is on the march. Wars will wash over us. Bombs will fall. All civilization will crumble. But not yet, please. Wait. There's no hurry. Let us be happy. Give us our moment. We are happy. Aren't we, Leon? Yes, sweetheart. We always will be. So happy. I'm going home now. Good night, Nanochka. Dream of me, of us, and I'll wake you in the morning. Just a moment. Good morning, Leona. Good morning. Oh, sorry to disappoint you, Mademoiselle Yakusova. We met last evening. Remember? Oh, yes, the Duchess Swan. Come in. I suppose you've discovered your jewels disappeared sometime during the night? Yes. Did you come to tell me that you had stolen them? <laughs> Stole is such an ugly word. Let us say, uh, I recovered them. I shall notify the police. Do? But won't it be rather embarrassing to explain to Moscow how you lost them? Perhaps. But won't it be embarrassing to you to have to explain to a judge just how you stole them? I'll fight you through every court in France. That will take at least two years. You haven't enough money to fight two years in court. I may run out of money, but your people have already run out of bread. You wanted to sell these jewels to feed them. Two years is a long time for your comrades to go hungry. Yes. Many will starve. Not if you accept my proposition. What is it? I'll give you the jewels if you take the 540 plane this afternoon to Moscow. And promise not to see or talk to Leon. You'll never win him that way. Not Leon. Well, what do you say? I have no choice when my people are hungry, Dorsus Swana. I will take the jewels and the 540 plane for Moscow. <laughs> Count Dalgu, I've told you it is impossible. But you've got to give me a visa. I've got to get to Moscow. No. But I'm sympathetic to your cause. I, I like the Soviet ideal. Everybody the same. 
You just like me, me just like you. I use your comb, you use my toothbrush. Give me a visa. <laughs> For the last time, no visa. What's the matter with me? You are a friend of the Duchess Swanda. No, no, I haven't seen her in over a month. Now look. No. All right, all right. I'll boycott your whole country. No more caviar, no more borch, no more vodka, no more Tchaikovsky. Wait a minute, I know something even better than that. Oh, you do? What? This. Yes, and you can tell the Kremlin that's just the beginning. Comrade Ninochka Yakashova. Yes, Commissar. You have done such good work in Moscow the last three months. I'm sending you on an important mission. To Paris? No, to Constantinople. Oh. That Paris trip changed you, comrade. I know that you did not even seem to enjoy my May Day speech to the workers. What is my mission in Constantinople? Listen to this anonymous message. How can the Bolshevik cause gain the respect of the Turks when your two representatives, Bulyanov and Kopalski, get so drunk that they throw a carpet out of their hotel window and complain to the management that it did not fly? <laughs> You will take the first plane to Constantinople and investigate. Very well, Commissar. Not allowed. This is a secret mission. Welcome to Constantinople, Ninochka. See? We engaged the royal suite for you. Bulyanov, Kapowski. Please, please, comrade, don't start figuring out the cost in cows. Commissar Razinin is very angry with you. Good old Razzy Dazzy. Comrades, please. I must see your expense account at once. Don't ask for it. There is an old Turkish proverb. If something smells bad, why put your nose in it? <laughs> Someone has been boring from within. You went to Paris and were led astray. Now you come to Constantinople and the same thing happens. Who is back of this? Somebody looking for me? Lay on. I might have known. Oh, I've never seen you looking so happy, Ninochka. I know, Leon, and I shouldn't. It's all wrong. Something terrible's happened to me since I met you. Book. I'm even wearing lipstick. What a gesture for a sergeant. <laughs> Ulyanov. Kapolsky. Yes, little father. <laughs> Go search the city for me. And if you find me, which you won't, come back here and report. We catch on, little father. Come, Ulyanov. <laughs> come in, Kopalski. <laughs> Leon. Leon, darling. I'm never going to let you go again. But I have to return to Moscow. If you do, I'll continue boring from within. I'll make every Russian envoy into a Bulyanov and Kopalski. <laughs> That is a terrible threat. I'll destroy the whole country, man by man. Once you saved Russia by going back, this time you can save Russia by staying here. Oh, darling, it shall never be said that Ninochka was a bad Russian. I will stay here with you. <laughs> Thank you, Rosalind Russell and Spencer Tracy. Thanks to you, too, Melchior Lengo, for permission to use your story. And to you, Oscar Bradley, for the swell music. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's broadcast here from the stage of the Gulf Theater is the last one of our present Hollywood series. And as a representative of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, I'd like to thank all the stars and authors who have contributed their talents during the past season. Beginning next week at the same time, Gulf brings you The Adventures of Ellery Queen. Right now, John Conti's trying to get Ellery Queen on the phone from New York so that Ellery himself can tell you about his adventures for next week. I'm sure you'll... Oh, that must be the call now. I'll take it, Johnny. Hello? Mr. Pryor, I have New York for you. Fine. Put Ellery Queen on. Go ahead, Mr. Queen. Roger Pryor? Hello, Roger. Oh, thanks. Well, we're all very happy about it here. Our first case for the Gulf audience next week? Just a moment, Roger. Nikki, what's our first case for next week? The Adventure of the Double Triangle. Adventure of the Double Triangle, Roger. Well, it's the kind of murder case that might have happened to your next-door neighbor. 
You see, Inspector Roger... Queen. Henry, get your hat and coat. Shh, Inspector Queen. Ellery's talking to Roger Pryor in Hollywood. One moment, Dad. Sorry, Roger. My dad just barged in with Sergeant Veely. Come on, Mr. Queen. We got a stiff weight. A murder, Ellery. Looks like a puzzling. Murder case? Sorry, Roger. I'll have to cut this short. I'll call you back as soon as I can. Goodbye. Stop into it, son. All right, Dad. Coming. Well, son, this body you see lying on this dining room floor is what was left of a shyster liar they called the Fox. Yeah, he hung the double cross on every crook he ever defended. Took their dough and sold them out. Hmm. Only this one clue, huh? But what does it mean, Ellery? Why should we find a fistful of granulated sugar in one of the murdered man's hands? Well, let's see now. This dead man, target of underworld hate, was dining here alone when his murderer knocked on the door. The fox answered the door and was instantly shot. The murderer flee. Didn't die right away, though. That's what Doc Prouty said. And the blood trail shows the fox crawled back to the dining room, reached up to the table where he'd been eating... And deliberately grabbed a handful of sugar from the open sugar bowl. I say he was mad. And then kicked off, leaving us a headache. Curious clue... Suspect's dead? The facts show only three men could have committed this crime, son. One's a smuggler, bad actor. Sing Sing, three times for dope smuggling. Second one's an educated Poloco who's kind of cute at imitating handwriting. Two convictions for forgery. And the third possibility? A blackmailer, another bad egg. I've got all three of them in the next room, but I'll be drawn and quartered if I know which one of them shot the fox tonight. Oh, but you should, Dad. Oh, there he goes. You know already? Yeah. Get it, Ellery. Well, Nikki, if you'll get Roger Pryor back on the phone, I'll tell all of you who killed the fox. Right away, Ellery. Long distance, please. Yes, Roger. Those were the facts. Puzzled? Oh, you're not puzzled. You think it was? No, Roger. <laughs> As a one-man jury, you're a good program director. The only reason the fox could have had for crawling back to his table after he was shot and grabbing a handful of granulated sugar with his dying strength was obviously to leave a clue to his murderer's identity. How could granulated sugar identify one of the three suspects, Roger? Well, the fox couldn't have meant sugar literally, because there's no possible tie-up between sugar and forgery, smuggling or blackmailing, is there? So the fox meant something that looked like sugar. What does granulated sugar look like? Well, it's a white, crisp, powdery substance. Does that suggest anything connected with a forger? No. Blackmailer? No. Smuggler? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> you don't see the connection? Well, what was our smuggler convicted for? Smuggling dope. A white, crystalline, powdery substance. Conclusion? By leaving the sugar as a clue, the fox was accusing the dope smuggler of having shot him. Oh, but it was really very simple, Roger. <laughs> well, thanks. And now, speaking for the Gulf Oil Companies and for the good Gulf dealers, I'd like to ask you to congratulate the members of the motion picture industry and take a few bows for yourself, Roger. Thanks a lot. Goodbye, and good luck to all of you in Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned to this station, because immediately following station identification... Cary Grant, Rosalind Rutter. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Your host, the director of the star's own theater, Roger Pryor. Good evening, everyone. Your neighborhood good Gulf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies welcome you to the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. During the next half hour, you're going to hear a rollicking yarn about the craziest business in the world, the newspaper game. It's His Girl Friday, starring Rosalind Russell and Cary Grant with music by Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra with Frank Tours conducting. In just about two quick ticks of a watch, our two box office champions will come out of their corners fighting. While we're waiting for that to happen, I'd just like to remind you folks that today you're getting a lot more car for your money than ever before. And you might naturally think that the bigger the car, the more complicated the engine, the more care you'd have to give it. But thanks partly to your friend, the good Gulf dealer... Cars today are actually easier to care for. Of course, there are some mighty important things to see to. Such things, for instance, as checking the oil, the water, and the tires. If things like that aren't done and done regularly, you may be in for a heap of trouble. That's why it's just plain common sense to stop at your local Gulf dealers. You see, he's trained himself to look after such things. 
Every month, he gets a special eight-page folder with information about the latest cars, how to care for them, what things to look for that might cause you trouble. So give him a chance to give you really top-notch service. Tomorrow, stop at the sign of the Gulf Orange Disc at your neighborhood Good Gulf Dealers. <laughs> and here come the stars, Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell are just making their entrances on our Gulf Theater stage. The house lights fade, and here are Rosalind Russell as Hilde Johnson and Cary Grant as Walter Burns. I'll play the part of Bruce Baldwin. And now, his Girl Friday. <laughs> the office of Walter Burns, managing editor of the Morning Post. The door opens to admit Hildy Johnson, ex-star reporter and former wife of Walter Burns, who has dropped in for a farewell visit with her one-time husband. Walter's busy talking on the phone and doesn't see Hildy. Don't give me that duffy. You drag your bloody carcass out of that juke joint. Find the governor. You are two in a juke joint. I can hear music through the phone. You tell him, Walter. Shut up. Now listen, Duffy, the governor has to sign that reprieve because if Earl Williams gets hung tomorrow morning, the Morning Post is washed up. Now find the governor. Of all the petrified pit... Hildy! Hello, Walter. Well, Hildy. Hildy. Hmm. Hmm. Gee, it's good to see you. Thanks, Walter. Let's see. Uh, how long has it been? Well, I was in Reno six weeks, then Bermuda. Oh, about four months, Walter. Ah, uh, Hildy, you look wonderful. Yep. You look like the latest edition right off the press. And aren't you sorry your subscription's been canceled? <laughs> Hildy, I could cry. You did the wrong thing. You never should have divorced me. Makes a fellow lose all faith in himself. Gives him a feeling he wasn't wanted. Now, that's a beautiful understatement, but you see, that's what divorces are for. Nonsense, Hilda. You've got the old-fashioned idea that divorces last till death do us part. Well, divorce doesn't mean anything today. Hildy, we've got something between us. Nothing can change. Oh, I suppose that's true in a way. Not a girl. I just wish you weren't such a stinker. Hmm? <laughs> now, why did you promise not to fight our divorce and then do everything you could to gum up the whole work? Oh, well, I was only a husband trying to protect his home. What home? What home? Don't you remember the home I promised you as soon as we got back from our honeymoon five years ago? No, what a honeymoon. Instead of two weeks in Atlantic City, we spent two weeks in a caved-in coal mine with a man named Krupski. <laughs> uh, yeah, wasn't that a whale of a story? Oh, look, what's the use of fighting, Hildy? You come back to work on the paper, and if you find we can't get along in a friendly way... We'll get married again. What? Oh, Walter, you are wonderful in a loathsome sort of way. Well, thanks be to heaven, you're no longer my husband and no longer my boss. Look, third finger, left hand. Hmm, very pretty ring. Isn't it? Yep, wonderful what you buy at the dime stores. <laughs> now, this was given to me, Walter. I am getting married. And I'm also getting as far away from the newspaper business as I can get. Really? Hmm. What do you do? Get some poor guy drunk and make Google eyes at him? Why, you bumble-headed baboon? If all you don't right, stop all talking... right. Go ahead. Get married. I know his type. One of those matrimonial draft dodgers. <laughs> Where'd you meet this heel? On the beach in Bermuda. What is he? A beachcomber? What's his name? His name is Bruce Baldwin, and he's oh, in the Baldwin? insurance business. Hmm. And he's kind and he's sweet, and he treats me like a woman. How did I treat you? Like a water buffalo? <laughs> and he wants a home and children. Ooh, my. It sounds more like a guy I ought to marry. <laughs> Don't you think I ought to meet this paragon and, well, you know, sort of congratulate him? That's so sweet of you, Walter, but when you're sweet, somebody always gets loused up. Oh, no. Hildy, Hildy, you don't mean to say you're afraid to have me meet him. Afraid? Now, why should I be afraid? I'll call him in. He's right outside. Baldwin, Baldwin. I knew a Baldwin once. Pickpocket in St. Louis. Couldn't be. Oh, Bruce. Yes, Hildy? Come in, dear. Is, uh, is anything wrong? No, no, everything's under control, Bruce. I want you to shake hands with the best managing editor and the worst husband I ever had, Walter Burns. Well, this is a mighty fine pleasure, Mr. Burns. Well, thank you, Bill. Give me back my hand, will you? Well, well, well. <laughs> You're the lucky man, huh? You know, Bruce, certainly hate to lose Hildy. She's a fine newspaper man. If I ever needed her, this is the time. Now, no walk is Walter. Earl Williams case, well, I'm Bruce. afraid I'm behind in the news, Mr. Burns. Uh, who is Earl Williams? Well, he was just a poor little bookkeeper who lost his job. He went screwy, traveling around the parks, making soapbox speeches. A cop came to quiet him down, Bruce. Yeah, Williams shot the cop, and tomorrow morning, Williams hangs. Well, if Williams was crazy when he did it, why doesn't the state put him away? Well, because there's an election coming up in a few days, and the mayor is using the gallows for a bandwagon. Yeah, the mayor would hang his own grandmother to be re-elected. Well, I'm certainly glad you told me. I won't vote for him. Yeah. Uh, spoken like a true rover boy, Bruce. Now, look, Walter. 
Don't they have to have another expert examine Williams before they hang him? Sure, a guy named Engelhoff is going to do it. He'll say Williams is sane just like the rest. Well, suppose he does. Uh, what do you mean, Hildy? Now, look, Walter, why don't you get an interview with Earl Williams? Uh-huh. Then print Engelhoff's statement. Yeah, yeah. And right alongside of it, you know, double column. Yeah, yeah, go on. Uh, you run the Williams interview. Uh-huh. Alienist says he's sane, yeah. and the interview shows he's goofy. Oh, Hildy, it's wonderful. You could do it. You could save that poor devil's life. Yes, I know. I... Oh, no, I couldn't, Walter. No, Bruce and I are taking the 4 o'clock train to his home in Albany. Now, Hildy, we could take the 6 o'clock train if it would save a man's life. No, Bruce. Listen to Bruce. No, Bruce, I am through with this crazy business. Well, that's right. Now, look, Brucey boy, I'll tell you what. You persuade Hildy to do this story, you can write yourself a nice fat policy for oh, me. Oh, Mr. Burns, I couldn't use my wife for business purposes. Uh... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Bruce. What's the commission on a nice fat policy of, say, uh... Say $10,000, No, let's quick. say $100,000. Too quick. All right, $100,000. Now, wait a minute. Huh? <laughs> well, the commission on that would be a thousand. Bruce, Bruce, we could use the thousand dollars. Now, how long would it take to have Walter examined? Oh, I could get a company doctor here in ten minutes. How about it, Tiger? Oh, I thought you meant me. Okay, okay, get the company. All doctor. right, all right, it's a deal. Now, look, Bruce, I'll be in the press room of the criminal courts building. Mm-hmm. That's right by the jail where they've got Williams. Now, you phone me as soon as you've got Walter's check, and be sure it's certified. Huh. Maybe you'd like my fingerprints too. <laughs> no thanks, I've still got those. <laughs> How much money have you got on you? Five hundred dollars. It'll be safer with me. But Hildy... Now, now, really, dear, I know what I'm doing. Mr. Burns might get you into a crap game. But, Hildy, I don't gamble. Darling, I knew a little man once who didn't drink till he met Walter Burns. Now they've got him in a bottle at Harvard. (laughs) Now, let me have the money, dear, please. Well, all right, here. Thank you, darling. Now, Walter, no tricks. No tricks, Hildy. Honest, I cross my heart. I'll even go further than that. I know. You'll double-cross mine. Criminal Court's press room. Who? Hey, Hildy, it's for you. Thanks, Jake. Hildy Johnson speaking. Oh, hello, Bruce. You got the check? Certified? Oh, fine, dear. Wait a minute, though. Maybe it isn't so fine. Look, Bruce, put the check in your hat. In your hat, dear. Yeah, I know it sounds silly, Bruce, but, but do it for me. And don't let Mr. Burns see you. That's fine, dear. Now go right down to the railroad station and wait for me. I'll be there just as soon as I can. Hello, Walter Burns speaking. Who? Oh, yes, Louis. Look, I've got a job for you. No, you don't have to croak anybody. All you have to do is pick up a beefy gent by the name of Bruce Baldwin at the railroad station. He's got my certified check in his wallet. And I want that check back, you understand? Great. Oh, oh, Louis. Do you think you could fix it so that Mr. Baldwin would be very busy around four o'clock? Fine, thanks. Hello, Hilda Johnson speaking. Yes, Bruce. Where are you? Your what? In jail? For stealing whose watch? His name is Louie. Now listen, don't worry, dear. Just hang up and I'll get you out of there right away. That double-faced, triple-crossing, two-timing snake. I'll show him he can't. Hello? Hello, Walter. I've got some news for you. Now get this, you double-crossing chimpanzee. If I ever lay my two hands on you again, I'll hammer that monkey skull of yours so hard it'll ring like a Chinese gong. Oh, you don't, don't you? Well, maybe Louie can tell you why Bruce is in jail for stealing somebody's watch. Goodbye, you run over heel. I'm going to Albany and you can go to... Well, boys, you heard it. So long, you copy slaves. Oh, you leaving, Hildy? Does my heart good to hear Walter Burns told off. When we see you again, Hildy. You and the criminal courts building are never going to see me again, Jake. I'm going to be a wife and not a news-getting machine for a two-faced maniac. I'm never even going to read a newspaper again. I'm going to Albany and settle the... Hey, what's that? Hey, it's a jailbreak. Hey, look, it's Williams. He's crawling along the edge of that roof there. Get out of my way. Hello. Let me speak and give me the desk. Hey, Mike, get this. Hello. Earl Williams Hello, just... Hello, Shut up, you lughead, and get this. Earl Williams just escaped from the county jail. Yes, yes, don't worry, Walter. Hilda's on the job. Walker's on. I thought you were on the job. Oh, yes, Weasel. But i got to get the exclusive story, and I've got it now on Williams and how he escaped. But it cost me 500 bucks to tear it out of the wharf. Never mind that. What's the story? You'll get it when you pay me the 500. That money belongs to Bruce. Oh, you'll get it back. I swear it on my mother's grave. All right, wait. Just a minute. Your mother's alive. All right, I'm a grandmother's grave. Don't be so technical. Well, send over the money, and you get the story. Otherwise, no soap. What's the matter with you, Hildy? Why worry about a little money? I'll see if you get it right away. Hold the wire a second. Louis. Yeah, boys. I need $500 worth of counterfeit money. No, I just happen to have it on me. Thanks. 
Hello, Hilly. The money's on the way. Louis starting right now. He'll be there with the 550 minutes. He's got to pass the bank anyway. Okay, Walter. Wait a minute. It's after 3 o'clock. The banks are closed. Not to Louis. Now, listen, Hilly. While you're waiting, see if you can pick up an eyewitness. Okay, Walter. I'll call you back a little later. <whistles> what a day. Uh, come in here, Fred. I think we can... Oh, oh, hello, Miss Johnson. I thought this room was vacant. Greetings, Sheriff Hartwell. Hello, Hildy. And the mayor, too. Well, well, I imagine after what's happened, you two boys want to be alone. We'll see you on the front page. Huh. Yeah. Did you hear that, Sheriff? This blunder of yours will make me the laughing stock of the town. No, Mayor. Williams can't get away. If he does, I'm absolutely washed up in next week's election. Why, his hanging was one of my solemn campaign promises. What do you want? My name is Petty Bob. I don't care who you are. I said, what do you want? I'm looking for Sheriff Peter B. Hartwell. I'm the mayor. He's the sheriff. Well, go away, Mr. Pettibone. I'm busy. But, Sheriff, I've got a message for you from the governor. It's a reprieve for Earl Williams. What? <laughs> what does this mean, Sheriff? You promised me there wasn't going to be a reprieve. Well, now, Fred, how did I Mr. know? Mr. Pettibone, who else was there when the governor gave you that reprieve? Why, nobody, Mayor. He was out fishing. Uh. Hello? Yes, yes, this is the sheriff. What? Holy Moses. Fred, the rifle squad has Williams trapped right up on the roof. Cover up that mouthpiece. Listen, you, Mr. Uh, Petty Bone. Bone. You'll never arrive at this reprieve. Yes, but I... Here's a hundred bucks that says you did. You understand? You never brought this reprieve. Well, I don't know whether my wife would like... Here, you go to this address and uh, you forget you ever had a Uh, wife. uh, You told the mayor sent you. Goodbye. Fred, the captain in charge of the rifle squad is still on the phone. Good. Well, what'll I tell him to do about Williams? You tell him to shoot the kill. I'm back in the press room. I just called to say goodbye. Oh, you got the money? Yes, Louie brought the 500, and I'm going to get Bruce out of jail on the way to the railroad station. No hot feelings, Hildy. No, no, of course there's no hot Walter. What's the matter? There's someone at the window. He called down from the roof. Walter, listen. Drop that phone. Williams. Stand back. Put that gun down, Earl. No, I won't. You're not going to shoot me, Earl. Why, I'm your friend. I don't believe you. You're going to tell them I'm here, so they'll hang me. Earl, Earl, put down that gun. I'm going to kill you. Oh! Oh, I guess I used all the shells. I can't shoot you. I can't shoot anybody. Earl, you must never do that again. Give me that gun. I'm awful tired. I couldn't go through another day like this. I couldn't go through the last minute. Well, they'll hang me now, right out there. I saw the gallows. No, 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 they won't. Now, listen, don't worry, Earl. I'll save you. If there were only some place to... Earl, get in that desk. No, no, it's... No, no, it isn't too late. The desk, the other reporters won't find you in there. Get in the big roller top desk and pull the lid down. Come on, come on, Earl, get in. Well, all right. You can trust me, Earl. Now listen, pull the lid down and remember, whatever happens, don't make a sound. Hello, hello, Walter. Are you still there? Listen, I'm all right. I really am. Now listen, stick on that hat of yours and beat it over here as fast as you can. I've got the hottest exclusive story in town wrapped up in a roller top desk. Mr. Burns, believe it or not, your ace reporter, Hildy Johnson, has just captured Earl Williams. That, folks, was Act One. Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell will be back following our usual brief intermission, which we will put to good use with some mighty helpful information. A man or woman who drives a car hears a lot of talk about motor oils, and a good deal of it can be mighty confusing. And yet, any motorist can easily determine just how good a motor oil actually is. You can tell with your eyes, your ears, and your pocketbook. Take Gulf Pride motor oil, for instance... Use Gulf Pride in your car, and your eyes tell you that Gulf Pride stays up to the full mark a long, long time. Your ears tell you that Gulf Pride helps keep your motor purring like a contented kitten. And your pocketbook tells you that Gulf Pride helps keep repair bills down with a capital D. That's because Gulf Pride motor oil is refined by the famous Alclor process, a process that makes Gulf Pride more resistant to the chemical breakdown of oil that's caused by air. So, being more air-resistant, Gulf Pride forms less sludge, less carbon, less engine varnish. Naturally, then, it lasts longer, gives you finer lubrication, and saves you money. So, next time, let your eyes, your ears, and your pocketbook be your guide, and get Gulf Pride motor oil. And 
Now the curtain of the Gulf Screen Guild Theater is ready to rise on the second act of Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur's great play, His Girl Friday. Starring Rosalind Russell as Hildy Johnson and Cary Grant as Walter Burns, her ex-husband and managing editor of the Morning Post. It's a short time later, and Walter, in response to Hildy's excited summons, has arrived at the press room of the criminal courts building. He's bending over the roll-top desk where Hildy has hidden the escaped Earl Williams. Hildy, having completely forgotten that Bruce Baldwin, her fiancé, is still waiting for her to get him out of jail, is pounding out her story on the typewriter. Give it all you got, Hildy. I'm going to smear it over the front page. Earl Williams captured by the morning post. Hey, Williams, how are you doing in there? Let me out. I can't stand it. Keep quiet. I kept her blonde in there for three days. Once, what have you got to squawk about? Maybe he wants you to put the blonde back. <laughs> Hello? Yep, Duffy. Duffy, here's your lead for that story. The blackest page in American history. You got that? Set it up. I'll shoot you the copy just as fast as Hildy pounds it out. And Walter, Duffy. I just happened to think. Hello, Duffy. You still there? All right, look. Send over Butch and a dozen strong arm guys. I want to move Williams in the desk out of here. Walter, I've got to go. We'll load out the window with pulleys, you dope. Can you imagine that? Hey, Hildy, where do you think you're going? I've got to get Bruce out of jail. Are you crazy? How can you worry about a man who's resting in a nice, quiet police station while this is going on? Hildy, this is war. You can't desert me. I've got to collect Bruce and catch that train. We're getting married. You drooling idiot. There's 365 days in a year you can get married. How many times have you got a murderer locked up in a desk? Once in a lifetime. Oh. Hildy, you've kicked over the city hall like an apricot. You've got the man, the sheriff, backed against the wall. This isn't just a newspaper story. It's a career. And you stand there worrying about getting married. Gee, Walter, I, I never figured it that way. Why, right, Hildy, they'll be naming streets after you. There'll be statues of you in the park. The radio will be after you. The movies. By tomorrow morning, I bet you there's a Hildy Johnson cigar. I can see the billboards now. It says, line up with Hildy Johnson. Oh, Walter, stop that handy. we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, now you're talking. Now, as soon as Butch and the boys get here, we'll move Williams and the desk over to my office. Now, sit down that typewriter. Get the story rolling. All right, Walter. Can I call the mayor bird to pray? Call him anything you like. Give him the works. What the blazes happened to Butch? Why doesn't he... Is that you, Butch? No, it's me, Bruce. Oh, it's a now, what the devil do you want? Why don't you stay in jail? Well, I've got to talk to Hildy. Well, come on in. I've got to keep this door shut. Hildy? Uh, Hildy? What? Oh, Bruce, how did you get out of jail? Well, not through any help of yours. Will you please tell me? I'd be trying you to tell him you. nothing. He's a spy, Hildy. Now, you keep out of this. Hello? Yes, this is Walter Burns. Uh, Hildy, what happened to a you? story, Bruce. A wonderful story. Now, wait a minute, Butch. What do you mean you, you know can't what I had over? to do, Hildy? I had to wire home for $100. Oh, really, I'm bagel. sorry, Bruce. Really, here's your 500 you gave me to keep. I'll explain what? everything later. Now, listen, Butch. I'm depending on you. Wait a second. Hildy, will you please get going on that story? Yes, Walter, excuse me, But, Bruce, Hildy, please. this isn't the money I gave oh, you. Oh, I know, I know. I spent that. I got this from Walter. Now, get this straight, Butch. You made tracks over here. Hildy, dear, I'm taking that 9 o'clock train. And don't forget to bring your gang. Are you coming to Albany with well, me, Hildy? I'm pounding on you, Butch. Don't let me down. Did you hear me? I now, said, Bruce, are you coming? Please, com- I'm trying to write. Why, Hildy. Kind of girl, Hildy. Now, you shut up, Mr. Burns. What? You're doing all this to her. Hildy, I don't think you love me oh, at all. Oh, darn it. I broke my nail. Yeah, I see what you did. You broke her nail. I see what you are now. You're just a reporter. A story means more to you than a clean, honest life in Albany. Oh. But in case you come to your senses, I'll be at the station waiting for the 9 o'clock train. Goodbye. How can you imagine a guy like that? Now, come on. Come on, Hildy. Keep that typewriter hot. Now, look here, you. I can't stay in here any longer. Hey, Williams, get back in that desk, you mock turtle, and stay there. But don't come out again unless you hear three knocks. Like that. Now, you got that? Good. Now, sit tight. Now, how's it coming, Hildy? Pretty good. Where's Bruce? 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 Who's Bruce? Oh, Bruce! You went out to get a cup of coffee. Oh, is he coming back? I didn't... You hear what he said? Sure, he's coming back. Hildy, you'll be back any minute. Keep that coffee rolling. Hello? Hello, Duffy? Well, where is Duffy? Oh, he is? All right, all right. When he comes back, tell him to get him alone, this boy. I got a hunch butchers ranted on us. Call me back. Well, what have you got, Hildy? And while hundreds of the sheriff's relatives spread their reign of terror, Earl Williams was lur- lurking just 20 yards away. All right, pick Meanwhile, up your Meanwhile, the mayor, you... You double What are you in there for? I mean you, you backfiring black heart. Me- I just remembered. Remember what? Bruce isn't coming back here at all. He said he was taking the 9 o'clock train. Oh, well, in that case, he's gone by now. Don't sit there like a frozen robin. Get on with the story. What a sap I am. Yes, well, now you've had a nice rest. Get back to work. I'm not going back to work, Walter Bain. I'm still... Uh, now, listen to me. I've still got 10 minutes to meet Bruce and catch the 9 o'clock train, and I'm going. Now, Hilly, don't open that door. I'm going to Bruce. Hilly, don't! Just don't try and stop me, that's all. Oh, uh, hello, Hilly. Oh, hello, Sheriff. We were just looking for you. Listen, Sheriff, I've got a train to catch. Better hold it, Sheriff. Yeah, she and Walter Burns are cooking up something. Now, wait a minute, boys. What do you mean? 
anything by breaking in here like this. Oh, let go of me, will you? Ask her where William says. Yeah. Hildy yeah. doesn't know anything. Hildy, I want you to talk. All right, what do you want me to say? What do you know about Earl Williams? What do you know about Earl Williams? No, oh, I got ways of making you talk. Hildy, you're under arrest. And you too, Burns. Who's under arrest? Listen, you insignificant, square-toed, droop-snooted spy. Do you realize what you're doing? I'll show you what I'm doing. Burns, you're obstructing justice, and I'm going to see that you're fined $10,000. You'll see nothing of the kind to work. And I'm going to begin by impounding the morning post property. Is that roller top desk yours? No! Yeah! Why, well, of course it is, Hildy. Why lie to the sheriff? Huh? Sheriff! I dare you to move that desk out of here. Oh, why, yes, Sheriff. You just dare move it out. I warn you, Sheriff. You touch this desk, you'll be sued. Oh! What was that? There's someone in that desk. No, it was just my knees knocking, Sheriff. You've got Williams in that desk. Stand back, everybody. Get out your guns, men. No, wait a minute. Don't shoot him. He's harmless. Williams is a dangerous criminal. Shoot right through the desk. No! Call Duffy! Keep away from that pole. You want to get a scoop, you beetle-faced mongoose? Everybody aim at the center. When I say three... One, two... Hello, Daily Bulletin. Hold the press. And... Williams! I couldn't stay on there any longer, Miss Hildy. Go ahead, Sheriff. I give up. Go ahead. Shoot me. He's unarmed, boys. We got him. Flash, Earl Williams kept in criminal court's press room. Flash, Earl Williams. And coming, boys. Flash, Williams in desperate struggle, but police overpowered him. Take him away, boys. I'll be with you as soon as I finish with these two. Come on, Williams. Ah, oh, Duffy. The morning post just turned Williams over to the sheriff. Oh, give me that phone, Burns. Well, Sheriff, what's all the excitement? We got Williams, Mayor. Caught these two red-handed trying to kidnap him. Splendid, Sheriff. I think they both get ten years for this. Anytime you think you can lick the morning post, Mayor, it's time for you to get out of town. Yeah, uh, we've been in worse jams than this, haven't we, Hildy? No, Walter, we haven't. Thanks, Ed. You forget the power that always watches over the morning post, Mayor. Hello, Duffy, get my lawyer. All the lawyers in the world are going to go... Boys, oh, boys, oh, boys, oh, boys. Terrible. I mean, who is this man? Why, don't you remember me, Mayor? I'm the man that brought you the Earl Williams reprieve. Wait a minute. You don't mean a reprieve from the governor. Of course not. You... Oh, but of course, yes. And here's your money back, Mayor. My wife said I shouldn't take bribes. Bribes? Who was trying to bribe you? A hundred dollars. That's all he gives well, me. Well, the man's an imposter. I never... Mm. Besides, he's insane. Uh. You're both another. Why, you uh... I I gave them the Earl Williams reprieve hours ago, but they gave it right back to me and a hundred dollars to forget all about it. Uh-huh. So you would hang an innocent man, would you? Trying to swing an election with a rope, eh? No, Harry. no, no, no. I wouldn't hang an innocent man. <laughs> but my dear girl, you you got the wrong attitude. My dear man, Williams almost got the wrong altitude. Now, let's forget this little incident. Come along, Sheriff. We'll take dear Mr. Pettibone over to the warden's office and deliver this reprieve ourselves. I'm sure it's all a little misunderstanding that might happen to anyone. That was a tight squeeze, Walter. Yeah. Hello. Hello, give me Duffy. Oh, of course, there was the time we stole old lady Haggerty's stomach off the coroner's table. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we've had some swell times, Hildy. A million laughs, but it's all over and you're doing the wise thing, Hildy. The newspaper game is a bad business. Well, well, you better get going. Meet Bruce. Oh. Oh, gee, Bruce is gone by this time. Well, send him a wire, honey. Meet him in Albany. You really mean that, Walter? Sure, I mean it. Now, can't you understand I'm doing something noble for once in my life? Get out of here, honey, before I change my mind. Walter, gee, listen a minute, will you? Uh... No, no, I know I made fun of Bruce. I know I got him in Dutch. You know why? Why, Walter? Uh, because I was jealous of him. You were? Yes. Yeah. Because he can give you the sort of life you want, Hildy. I'm sorry. I promise you Bruce will have no more trouble. Well, I, you know, I could stay and do the story and take the train in the morning. No, no, no. Forget I... it. Forget it. You better go. Hello, Duffy. Read me what you got so far. I'll get the other phone. Hello. Yes, this is Hildy Johnson. The 43rd Street Police Station. Did you say Bruce Baldwin? Arrested again? For passing counterfeit money. Oh, oh, hold on, Duffy. A little trouble coming up on this end. You sure it's counterfeit? And he says I gave it to him. Oh, I see. Goodbye. Now, 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 Hildy, I think I can explain. I don't blame you for being mad and... Well, if you're going to throw that telephone at me, go ahead. Get it over with. Oh, all of you, darling. Huh? Oh, honey. What are you crying about? Oh, now, you never cried before. Oh, I thought you really wanted me to go away with Bruce. I thought you didn't love me. Oh, 
Now, what were you thinking with, honey? I don't know. Well, what are you standing there gawking for? Send Louis down to the jail and give Bruce sure. some honest money so he can go back to Albany where yes. he belongs. Yes, yes. Hello, Duffy! Everything's fine now. Hilly and I are coming back to the office. No, she's not quitting. We're going to be married again. Walter, can we go on a honeymoon this time? Certainly, darling. Gee. Duffy, you can be married together while I'm on my honeymoon. Atlantic City, Walter. Yeah, Atlantic City, Hilly. A whole two weeks, Walter. Certainly, a whole two... Wait a minute. What's that, Duffy? A strike? What strike? In Albany? Oh, and I can't... All right, all right. Of... right. We'll honeymoon in Albany. Fine. Fine. Hey, Hilly. What? Well, I just thought of something. Albany. What is it, Walter? Hey, I wonder if Bruce has got a spare room. <laughs> Thank you, Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell. It was swell of you to give up time from busy shooting schedules to do this performance tonight in the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, our stars contribute their performances here in the Gulf Theater, and the money which the stars would normally receive, Gulf gives instead to the Motion Picture Relief Fund toward the building of a home for the less fortunate members of the picture industry. <laughs> Next week, the marquee of the Gulf Theater will read Ginger Rogers and William Powell. Ginger Rogers, in her first radio appearance since winning the Academy Award, starred with one of your favorite screen comedians, William Powell, in Lucky Partners. It's a story about a girl and a psychology-minded artist whose luck changes the minute they meet. Everything goes splendidly until they decide to go on an experimental vacation together a week before the girl is to marry another man. It's one of the funniest comedies of the season. There'll be music, of course, by Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra with Frank Tours conducting. So tune in the Gulf Screen Guild Theater next Sunday night at this same time. It's William Powell and Ginger Rogers in Lucky Partners. Rosalind Russell will soon be seen in MGM's The Uniform. Cary Grant's latest for Columbia Pictures is Penny Serenade. And remember, you've a date to attend the Gulf Theater a week from tonight when we present Lucky Partners, starring Ginger Rogers and William Powell. Until next week, then, this has been Roger Pryor speaking for your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. presents the Screen Guild Players. The Screen Guild Play tonight, take a letter, darling. The starring players. This is Rosalind Russell. This is Cary Grant. This is Edward Everett Horton. Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in Take a Letter, Darling. All of the stars on these programs donate their services and the money paid by the sponsor for these programs goes directly to the Motion Picture Relief Fund for the maintenance of their country house, caring for the members of the picture industry who are no longer able to provide for themselves. And now, our Screen Guild players present that fast-moving comedy of office romance, Take a Letter, Darling, starring Cary Grant, Rosalind Russell, and Edward Everett Horton. 
Our play opens in the reception room of Atwater and McGregor, nationally known specialists in advertising campaigns. As the curtain rises, Tom Burney is applying for a job. Good morning. Oh, good morning. I, uh, I have a letter of introduction to A.M. McGregor. Is it about a job? Yeah, the name is Tom Burney, and the letter's from Bill Dooley. Well, looking at you, I'll say you'll get the job. Chump. Huh? <laughs> Just a second. McGregor's office. Mr. Tom Verney to see you. He has a letter of introduction from Mr. Dooley. How does he look? Do you want my opinion as an employee or um, as a female? Is there a difference? Oh, definitely. As an employee, I'd say, uh, uh uh-uh. But as a female... (laughs) Well, run him in. I'll take a look at him for myself. McGregor will see you right away. Thanks. Where's the office? Right down the hall. You'll see the name on the door. Uh, Mr. Verney to see Mr. McGregor. I know. Give me the letter. Uh, huh? I said give me the letter, Barney. Verney. Oh, sorry. My letter's for McGregor, personally. I'm McGregor, personally. Uh, huh? Now give me the letter and sit down. Yes, sir. What was that? Uh, I mean, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Go ahead, Barney. No, no, no. Verney. Well, whatever it is, sit down while I read this. Well, Dooley didn't tell me McGregor was a lady. Is a lady. Oh. <laughs> oh, did you write this letter? No, no. I heard Dooley dictate it, though. We went to school together. Oh, then you know that you're a very clever lad and that I should be able to find a place for you here. Well, <laughs> oh, I told him to leave the very out. Oh. <laughs> just clever. Yeah, that's just what I told Dooley. For the third time, sit down. Ouch. <laughs> now, have you ever been in advertising before? No. What have you done? Well, uh, nothing. Oh, that's quite a career. Uh, Look, don't be silly. I had an income. Oh, and now your piggy bank is empty, eh? Yeah, well, you know what taxes do to a piggy bank. College graduate? Yes. Do you want to be in advertising? Well, uh, no. That's a great start. What would you like to do? Well, I guess I'm childish, but uh, that's my secret. Stand up. Can you wear clothes? Well, don't look now if I haven't any on. Please, now, will you answer my questions and try not to be cute? Oh, pardon me. Far away. Do you dance? Fairly well. No prizes. Have you any uh, romantic obligations? Uh, No, no. Well, I'll give you a try. The starting salary is $50 a week. Thanks, but what could I possibly do around here that's worth $50 a week? You'll be my private secretary. Secretary? Secretary? I don't know anything about typing or dictation or... Oh, we have plenty of girls in the office who are expert at all those things. Your duties will be more personal. Oh. Oh! (laughs) Well, uh, what do you say? Uh, no. No, no. What? No. Miss McGregor, I've admitted I'm here because I need the money. But if what I'm thinking is right, I'd rather go out and dig a good deep ditch. Mr. Vernick! Oh, you're sweet. In fact, you're positively precious. But believe me, I won't harm you. Well, I I just wanted to be sure. Now, before you start, I'd like to have my little say. My last four secretaries went out of here on their ears because their unusual duties gave them illusions of irresistible masculinity. Do you follow me, or are you ahead of me again? Oh, I'm sorry. Now, good. Now, you go to DeJay's the tailors right away and get yourself a full-dress suit. Here's the address. Tails? Tails, everything. Tell them it's a rush job and to charge it to my account. We're going out tonight. It, now, you'd oh, better but, hurry. But, Go on. Go on. You may have to have alterations. Well, uh, uh, all right. Well, wh- where will I meet you? Uh, just give me your address. I'll pick you up at your place at 7. Well? well just wanted you to know you needn't bring me a car <laughs> just, just bring me a white gardenia. That won't clash with my tie. <laughs> Goodbye. You'll be ready there at 7. I don't want to wait. <laughs> Well, at least you're prompt. That's something. Here's your gardenia. Oh, 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 no. Miss McGregor, you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble for unimportant little me. It's worth it. You look lovely. Get in. 
Well, this must seem a bit unusual to you, Vernie. It does. It is. A woman in business faces many problems, and the greatest problem she faces is men. Oh. I sell advertising to men. The fact that I'm a woman helps, but it also brings complications. Naturally. That's where you come in. Tonight, you're saving a big advertising account for me by reassuring a jealous wife. Oh, I'm reassuring a jealous wife? We're dining with Mr. and Mrs. French. Mr. Mm -hmm. French is advertising manager of Castle Soups. And you're trying to get the account. And I will get the account if Mrs. French will stop being suspicious of the time her husband spends with me. And the simplest way of reassuring her is to introduce her to my fiancé. Oh, is he going to be there, too? (laughs) He's you. Uh... Oh, I get it. Yeah, okay. There's nothing now underhanded about this. No, Mrs. No. French's suspicions are unfounded, and they should be corrected. Yes, yeah. Well, all I'm supposed to do is act like you belong to me. Yes, mm. so of course you love me. But you're confident. Naturally. It isn't every boy has a girl bringing him gardenias. <laughs> now stop it, and don't be coy. Give Mrs. French plenty of flattery and attention, and I'll get the account from Mr. French. Oh, what's the matter? Uh, well, I don't feel honest. I don't even feel like a man. Good evening, Pierre. Ah, good evening, Miss McGregor. Have my guests arrived? Mr. and Mrs. French. Yes, they're seated at your table. This way, please. Hello. Miss McGregor, this is Mrs. French. How do you do? How do you do? May I present my fiancé, Mr. Verney? Mrs. French? How do you do? Oh, oh, did you say your fiancé? Wow, charming. I hoped you'd like him. He's mad about dancing. Aren't you, dear? Oh, certainly. They used to call me Twinkle Toes. <laughs> Would you care to dance, Mrs. French? <laughs> oh, well, if, if Miss McGregor doesn't object. Oh, not at all. Mr. French and I can talk business while we're waiting. You danced divinely, Mr. Verney. Yeah, well, that's because you're so light on my feet. Oh, 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 I am sorry. Oh, don't apologize. It's a living. Uh, uh, You have a very lovely fiancé, Mr. (laughs) Verney. Oh, yeah. uh, Mac's quite a girl. Don't you ever worry about her? I mean, spending so many evenings in business conferences with men, uh, like my husband. Oh, go on. What is there to worry about? Mac loves me, and I trust her completely. Especially with this fine a wolf, uh, I mean a man, is your husband. Hey, uh, incidentally, Mr. French is a very lucky man. Oh, really, Mr. Bernie? How do you mean? Well, imagine the trouble he'd have if a woman like you, in the in the full bloom of maturity, should suddenly decide to spread her wings. Spread my wings? Oh, I'm Mr. Bernie. Oh, well, what a fun. Oh, yes, <laughs> isn't it, huh? Oh, it positively makes me vibrate. Yeah, well, you're probably just warming up for the takeoff. Oh, oh Mr. Bernie, you say the <laughs> oh, well. You're a great inspiration, Mrs. French. I hope Mr. French appreciates you. Oh, I don't think he does. No, I didn't think he would. <clears throat> but then, what man could, really? Good morning. Good morning, Miss McGregor. Oh, good morning, Jeanette. Has Mr. Atwater come in yet? Yes, Miss McGregor. Oh, well, good. If anyone wants me, I'll be in Mr. Atwater's office. How's the other half of Atwater and McGregor? Terrible, Mike. Just terrible. Well, cheer up. I'll have French's name on the contract before the day's over. I suppose I should be very happy. Oh, that new secretary of mine is a pip. Mrs. French not only isn't jealous of her husband anymore, she's wondering how she can get rid of him. Oh, dear, 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 dear. <laughs> Say, am I boring you? We've just added a brand new million dollar account to our books. Well, well, really, a whole million, well... Oh, I'm sorry, Mac, really I am, but last night I met a man who, in ten minutes, taught me to hate the world and him and myself. He sounds like a bad hangover. Who is he? Jonathan Caldwell, Jr., president of the Caldwell Tobacco Company, and I hope the Reader's Digest tests his cigarettes. Boy, last year that was a $5 million account. Yes, and this year it may be even more. Well, forget him. He's not our headache. Justin and Smith have that account tied up for life. (laughs) 
That's what they think. It just so happens that Mr. Caldwell and his sister, who owns the whole company, are in town now for the sole purpose of changing advertising agencies. Well, what are we waiting for? Where is he? What hotel? It's no use, Mac. I told you I talked to him last night. Well, I haven't. You not only haven't, you won't. Why not? Well, right now, Mr. Caldwell is paying alimony to four ex-wives, and it's gone to his brain, if he ever had one. At any rate, he not only hates his four ex-wives, he hates all women. Even his sister? No, he just despises her. Well, if four women have managed to talk him into matrimony, I should at least be able to talk him into a contract. Now, Mac, you're a more capable woman than I am. Oh, thanks. And I am a man. I wish you'd learn to let me finish a sentence. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. There isn't the slightest chance that you or any other woman could sell anything to Caldwell. Why, he hasn't had lipstick on his handkerchief in over a year. Uh, well, not that I have, I mean. Uh, uh, where, where are you going? Oh, where am I going? To study the tobacco business in general and the Caldwell Company in particular. I'll be up at my cabin. You're going alone? No, I'm taking my new secretary, Vernon. Mac, I'm convinced now. There ain't no Santa Claus. What's bothering you, Vernie? What, a secretary on a weekend with a boss and both of us reading? Yeah, yeah. Here are seven years of Caldwell's life in newspaper clippings. Seven years and four wives. I know. Seven years with the wrong woman. (laughs) Now he hates every woman he meets. Yeah, and according to the papers, he meets them all. Anyway, I volunteered to get this man-woman-hater's signature on an advertising contract. You'll get it. Why? Why? You're different, that's why. And the minute he finds out you're different, he's hooked. Thanks, but it won't be that simple. Oh, yes, it will. It wouldn't be for most women, but for you, it'll be a cinch. A woman without emotion can plan like a general in battle. Oh, I see. Bernie, tell me, why do you work at a job you don't like? Well, have you ever been to Mexico? What brought that on? Well... There are things down there yelling to be put on canvas, and I think I'm the guy to do it. Oh? How long have you been painting? Ever since I was a kid. Trouble is, I paint what I like. Nine times out of ten, that means no money. Are you good? Oh, I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Anyway, that's why I took this job. As soon as I save enough to buy a jalopy and a trailer, I'm going back to Mexico to paint my head off, live by the sun. Mm. I've dreamt those dreams. They never come true. Well, they will for me someday. Well, I'll tell you something silly. I write poetry. Well, go ahead and laugh. Why? All of us are poets. Some of us can put it in words, and some just get a a feeling. I like you, Vernie. Well, thanks. Never fall in love with me, will you? I'd hate to fire you and... I would if you fell in love with me. Don't worry. Well, why do you say it like that? And I couldn't fall in love with you if I wanted to. And I don't want to. Why not? Because you're a beautiful brain in beautiful clothes. No temperature, no pulse, that's all. I'm a brain with no pulse, eh? I'm a woman, Bernie. More woman than you've ever known. If ever I fall in love, it'll be the sea dashing against rocks. And lightning flashing across the sky. And thunder rolling through mountains. Yeah, I believe you mean it. It's true. Bernie. What are you going to do? Find out for myself. <laughs> yeah, come here. Come on. themselves look just as plain and severe as possible. But today it's so different. Today, in order to be successful in a career, a girl must be feminine and lovely to look at. And she's much too busy and much too clever to be willing to use a lot of preparation she doesn't really need, or to continue with methods that fail to bring results. So that's why so many successful women in business praise Lady Esther for purpose face cream. You see, they know they can count on this one cream by itself to help keep their skin looking fresh and well cared for. They know that Lady Esther Face Cream brings their skin these four important aids to beauty all in a single jar. Every time you use Lady Esther Face Cream, 
It thoroughly cleans your skin. It softens your skin. It helps nature refine the pores. And finally, it leaves a smooth, flattering base for powder. Is it any wonder many women write and tell me that Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream alone does more for the appearance of their skin, makes it look smoother and fresher than all the preparations they used before? Try it and enjoy the poise and assurance that comes from knowing you look your very best. And now the second act of Take a Letter, Darling, starring Rosalind Russell as McGregor, Cary Grant as Tom Burney, and Edward Everett Horton as Atwater. It's several days after Tom Burney kissed his boss. Instead of firing him, she entrusted him with the important job of landing the Caldwell Tobacco Company's advertising account. Right at this minute, however, she is pacing the floor in her partner's office. You know, Atwater, when I think of Tom Verney lolling around Raleigh, North Carolina, romancing Ethel Caldwell with our money, I could kill him. No, no, no. Calm yourself, Mac. Calm yourself. After all, this was your idea. It was not. It was indeed. You insisted on trying to land the Caldwell Tobacco Company's account. Now, didn't you? That has nothing to do with the case. It has everything to do with the case. I warned you to stay away from Jonathan Caldwell in the first place. Well, I didn't have any trouble landing Jonathan. Well, perhaps not. But at any rate, when you learned that his sister Ethel controlled the advertising account, you all but screamed for help. I didn't scream. And it was your idea that Bernie fly down to Raleigh with Ethel and sell her that campaign that you had created. Well, it wasn't my idea that he spend his time making love to her. Well, then give the man credit for some initiative. Listen to this newspaper story. Just listen to this. Constant companions at Southern Place Spots are Ethel Caldwell of the fabulously wealthy tobacco company and Thomas Bernie, New York advertising executive... Their whirlwind romance is the talk of Southern society. Well, I think that's wonderful. It sounds as though we're practically certain of getting the Caldwell account. Well, if we have to get it that way, I don't want the account. Oh. Oh, so that's the way the wind blows, McGregor. You're in love with Bernie. I am not. Then why are you worrying about his newspaper romance with Ethel Caldwell? Well, I... I'm, I'm just tired of his ignoring my instructions. Uh, I see. No, you don't. <laughs> He hasn't answered a wire in two weeks. Well, I might point out that you haven't answered one of Jonathan Caldwell's phone calls in two weeks either. That's different. Naturally. My wires to Tom were about business. Caldwell's trying to give me a romantic sales talk. No. Yes. You mean that that four times loser wants a fifth wife? That seems to be the idea. Oh. Oh, and I suppose that after Bernie marries Ethel Caldwell and you marry Jonathan, I won't be even a junior partner in this organization. Now, don't worry about that. I'm not marrying Jonathan, and Vernie isn't going to marry Ethel. Just how do you propose to stop him? I'm going down to Raleigh and straighten Mr. Vernie out myself. <laughs> and then I'm going to fire him. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Yes, she is. She's here, yes. It's for you, Max. Oh, well. Tell him I'm out. I can't. I told him you were here. <laughs> oh, all right. Hello? We're going to meet you right away, McGregor. No place. I'm taking the next train for Raleigh. Oh, that's perfect. I'll go with you. And forget about a hotel reservation because you'll stay with us at Caldwell Acres. Your man Bernie's there with my sister Ethel. Well, thank you very much. Now, what was on your mind? Well, I'll tell you about that when I get you on my home grounds with magnolias and moonlight to help me. I'll take a chance on anything, even becoming Mrs. Caldwell number five. If I can get down to Raleigh and get my hands on Tom Verney. Say, are you in love with Verney? What? Of course not. I hate him. Why? Oh, nothing, but I'm warning you. I want you myself. And I'm going to do everything I can to make you continue to hate Verney. Hello, Caldwell. Glad to see you. Hello, Vernie. I'm sorry Ethel and I were out riding when you and Mac arrived at Caldwell Acres. Yeah, it's just as well. I was anxious to talk to you before McGregor did anyway. Hey, uh, by the way, where is Mac? Now, up in her room, pouting. Coming down the train, I found out that she's really jealous of you and my charming sister. Oh, yeah? Well, it's about time. Ethel and I have been working hard enough at trying to make her jealous. Well, you've succeeded. The self-sufficient McGregor is just about ready to fall in your arms if. What do you mean, if? If you don't weaken it isn't enough just to make McGregor jealous. No? Well, what would you suggest? Go on, you've had four wives. You should have learned something about a woman. Well, now that you know Mac's jealous, don't let up. 
Oh, oh, really pour it on her, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> I get it. Make her think I'm really in love with Ethel, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Announce your engagement. Make yourself obnoxious. <laughs> hey, you think I could? <laughs> Without half trying. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine her trying to hold out against me? With you coaching me? <laughs> I don't know why you should spend so much time worrying about Bernie McGregor. He's enjoying himself somewhere with Ethel. I'm not worrying about Bernie. I'm worrying about the Caldwell Tobacco Company's advertising account. Well, you certainly don't need to worry about that. Why not? Well, when Bernie marries Ethel, he'll control the account. When Bernie... When Bernie I... marries Ethel? Who said he was going to marry her? Why, Bernie told me so himself. When? Well, this afternoon when you were up in your room resting. He said he hoped you wouldn't be jealous enough to do anything foolish, but uh, he had to look out for himself. Bernie said that? Those were his exact words. What? That egomaniac. Why should I be jealous of him? Why should I care what he does? Well, that's exactly what I told him, Mag. Bernie doesn't mean anything to me. He was just my stooge. And not a very good stooge at that. I hope I never see him again. I'll tell him so, too. Oh, he'll just laugh and tell you not to be jealous. Jealous? Me jealous of Tom Bernie. I'll prove to him that I'm not jealous. Well, that's a great idea if you can do it. I can do it. You asked me to marry you, didn't you, Caldwell? Is the proposal still in effect? It most certainly is. Then I accept your proposal. That ought to prove to Mr. Verney that I'm not jealous of him. Good night. Who is it? Me, Tom. Go away. But I've got something important to talk over with you. Well, I don't have anything to do. With you. Oh, yes, you do. Colbert well, just told me you'd agree to marry him. Well, why shouldn't I? Well, being jealous of me couldn't have driven you that far. Jealous of you? You think the fact that you are marrying Ethel Colville could have the slightest influence on my accepting Jonathan's proposal? I'm not marrying Ethel. You are, too. I am not. You sent me down here on business, and I've done everything you asked me to do. I didn't ask you to marry Ethel. Neither did Ethel. <laughs> Ethel's only interest in me was in getting a good advertising campaign. Well, you got it for her. Your pictures have been in every gossip column in the country. They have not. Jimmy Fiddler's mad at me. <laughs> anyway, I'm talking business. Tonight, Ethel okayed the campaign layouts and signed the contracts. Here it is. Thanks. Now, I've just earned that $10,000 bonus you promised me for landing this deal, and I'm quitting. Effective as of right now. Quitting? Where are you going? To Mexico, if you must know, in a trailer. But you can't leave me now. Can't I? Well, don't let my dust get in your eyes. Are you going alone? Certainly I'm going alone. Oh. And just to show you how stupid a man can be, I'll tell you something. I honestly believed once that you'd be making this trip with me. Me painting. And you writing your poetry. Did you mean that? Yeah. It was so real that you stubbed your toe while I was taking you through the Aztec ruins. I did? Yes. Yeah. I was a fine chump. You couldn't even love Caldwell. Of course I don't love Caldwell. Oh, you don't love anything but yourself and money. Well, you're going to have more money than you ever dreamed of, Mrs. Caldwell V. You planned your life with nice, cold-blooded perfection and accomplished everything you set out to do. You're a fine money-grubbing machine. So that's all you think of that's me? That's all I think of you. As I told you once before, you're a beautiful brain in beautiful clothes. No temperature, no pulse, and that's all. Is that so? Yeah. Well, as long as we're reminiscing, I gave you the answer to that once before, oh, too. Sure. I told you then I'm more woman than you've ever known. Oh. It's true. If I weren't, I wouldn't have lost my head and told Colwell I'd marry him just to spite you. What? I told you that love could only happen to me once. And you... You were that one. I've always known that if I ever fell in love, it, it would be the sea dashing against rocks. Lightning flashing across, across the, the sky, sky and thunder, thunder rolling, rolling through, through the, the mountain. mountain. Well? Huh? <laughs> That's your cue. Come on, Tom. Turn on the thunder and lightning. <laughs> Thank you, Rosalind Russell, Terry Grant, 
Edward Everett Horton and Paul Stewart for your superb performances in tonight's play. Miss Russell, we enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. It was our fun. We'd like to express our thanks to Paramount Pictures, too, for permitting us to present our radio version of Take a Letter, Darling, adapted by Bill Hampton. Cary Grant has something exciting to tell you about next week's show. But first, I'd like to have you hear a word from one of America's foremost beauty experts, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Russell. Today, all over America, busy women who once used as many as three and even four different kinds of preparations for their skin are now changing to just one cream, Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream. And so many of them say that this one cream by itself does more for the appearance of their skin, makes it look smoother and fresher, makes it look younger than all the preparations they've used before. Now, here's why this is true. Lady Esther Face Cream brings your skin four important aids to beauty every time you put it on your face. First, it thoroughly cleans your skin, removes even the stubborn dirt from the mouths of the pores. Second, it softens your skin and relieves the dryness that may cause little lines. Third, it gives the texture of your skin a fresher, lovelier look because it helps nature refine the pores. And finally, you don't even need a special powder base anymore because Lady Esther Face Cream leaves your skin so soft and smooth that powder and makeup look more flattering than ever. So you see, smart women today waste no time on beauty preparations they no longer need. All they use to get these wonderful results is my one scientific face cream. Try it and see for yourself why more and more busy, lovely women every day are changing to Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream for the complete care of their skin. Ladies and gentlemen, Cary Grant. <laughs> Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players have a great dramatic treat for you. The tender and moving story of a lovable English school teacher. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. You will hear Mr. Basil Rathbone as Mr. Chips and Miss Merle Oberon as Mrs. Chips. I know you'll find it grand entertainment. Thank you, and good night. Next week, then, Merle Oberon and Basil Rathbone will appear in Metro Golden Mayor's Goodbye, Mr. Chips. The Screen Guild players are presented by Lady Esther from Hollywood. This is Truman Bradley saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. presents the Screen Guild Players. The Screen Guild play tonight, My Sister Eileen. The starring players... This is Rosalind Russell. This is Brian Ahern. This is Janet Blair. And this is George Tobias. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in the rollicking Columbia Pictures comedy, My Sister Eileen, starring Rosalind Russell as Ruth Sherwood, Janet Blair as her sister Eileen, Brian Ahern as Mr. Baker, and George Tobias as Mr. Apopolis. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players in My Sister Eileen. My name is Ruth Sherwood, the older Sherwood girl they always called me. And this is my sister, Eileen. Hello, all you nice people. I'm terribly happy to know you all. 
That's what I said. That's my sister Eileen. Ambitious, of course. But then we both are. Even back home in Columbus, Ohio, Eileen always wanted to act and I wanted to write. But, Ruth, you did write. Just heaps and heaps of stories. And for the newspapers, too. Gosh, I'll never forget that review of my play. Oh, Ruth, it was a wonderful play. Yes. Too bad you weren't in it. Well, it wasn't my fault if they put that Annie Wilkerson in at the very last moment. No. But the paper had gone to press already, and I thought they'd laugh us right out of town. Mm, but they didn't. We fooled them. We just up and left. What the Germans call a strategic retreat. Oh, that thrilling trip to New York. I remember every single bit of it, Ruth. Catching the bus. Glad you phoned me, Miss Eileen. No trouble at all to stop in front of your house. It's only a mile or so off my road. And riding in the bus. This seat is more comfortable when you tip it back, miss. Here, let me show you. And getting off the bus. That bag's too heavy for a little girl like you. I'll take it, miss. Oh, Ruth, I just loved it. Who wouldn't? But you weren't so happy when we trudged all over New York City looking for a place to live. And every one of them too expensive. Mm-hmm, I remember. We had $100. And that was the last we'd ever take from Dad. We were determined. We certainly were, wasn't I? <laughs> and then at last it was growing dark, finding that place in Greenwich Village, a noisy, dusty street. And the room wasn't up, it was down. In the basement, with the window right at the sidewalk level. And iron bars across it, too. A rather horrible place, I thought. But Mr. Apopolis, the owner, didn't seem to quite agree. Ladies, this is just what you have been dreaming about. Not the exquisite imitation fireplace. These big, comfortable day beds. And this... This interesting and exciting dormer window. Look, from here you can see light passing up and down. Well, anyway, the lower half. But, Mr. Apopolis, look... Now, let me not... point out a few salient features of this suite. Here is a model kitchenette, complete in every detail. Oh, is it equipped with... Uh... And over here is a most luxurious... A most luxurious bathroom. Oh, well, that's one thing I'm very fussy about. Also complete in every detail. Really? They, uh, they looked rather small to me. Small? In those two rooms you won't entertain. <laughs> Furthermore, in this suite, you have two doors. One to the front and one to the back. And the rent for the ladies, always a special price. $45 a month. $45? Just for a trial. Take it for a month on trial. Then if you're not 100% satisfied, I give you your first month's rent. You'll give us back the whole month's rent? The whole month. And August has 31 days. Well, um... Oh, Ruth, I don't see what we've got to lose. Now, he said he would give us our money back. Legally, you have me where you want me. I gave my word in front of two witnesses. Three, including me. Oh, please, Ruth. I'm so tired. Oh, well, all right. Here you are, Mr. Apopolis. 20, 40, 41... Two, three, four, five. Oh! oh! What was that? What was what? That noise. The whole room shook. <laughs> that just shows you how you'll get used to it. I didn't even notice it. <laughs> you mean that it happens all the time? A little blasting. The new subway. They're blasting a subway right underneath us? What are you worrying about? Does engineers know how much dynamite to use? Oh, but does it go on all the time? No, no, they knock off at about midnight and then they don't start again until six o'clock. Six in the morning? Grab your bag, Eileen. We can't live here. Listen, in New York, you live either A, over a subway, or B, where they're building a subway, or C, you don't live in New York. Stop double-talking and give us our money back. Don't be hysterical. I said I'd give you your money back and I will. At the end of the month, if you are still dissatisfied. Good night. Oh, Ruth. What are we going to do? We're going to do 30 days. 31 days, to be exact. Eileen? Yes? Didn't you put out the light? Well, I did, but there's a lamppost right in front of the window. Why don't you pull down the shade, Ruth? There isn't any shade. We're living in a goldfish bowl with indirect lighting. <laughs> Listen. What's that? A couple of drunks. They've stopped right in front of the window. I said, we ought to go back to that joint and get those two babes, eh? Yeah, oh. friend. Listen, we can get them. You go away from 
over there, you drunken loafer. Eileen. Hey, please, look, a dame. You go away from there. We'll call the police. Another dame. <laughs> Made to order. Pete, one for you, one for me. I'll take the plot. Oh, huh? my Hello, You get away from here. Get in the bed. I'm ready for one. Go away, I tell you. Go away. Hey, hey, what's going on there? Come on, break it up. Break it up. Ah, uh, just a social visit, Officer. Yeah, we were just... Yeah, well, we Come on, beat it, beat it, beat it. Oh, thank you, Officer. Hey, I'm awfully glad you came. Yeah, I'll bet you are. New in this neighborhood, ain't you? We just moved in today. Well, if you're smart, you'll move out tomorrow. <laughs> I'm particular what goes on on my beat. I'm warning you. Good night. Oh... Ruth, did you hear what he said? I'm afraid I did. Oh, gosh, Ruth. I'm scared. Oh, forget it, darling. It'll be all right. Suppose you bunk in with me tonight, huh? Oh, gee, thanks. If we're going to start looking for work tomorrow, we'll both need all the rest we can get. Yeah, that's right. Well, good night, Ruth. Good night, Eileen. Sleep tight. My name is Ruth Sherwood. Is the editor in? Well, uh... I'm the editor of this magazine, and why don't you let me edit it without your blasted interference? Yes, he's in. Baker, you're talking to the owner of this publication. Go on, get out. The owner is in, too. Miss Williams, I want you to get me, uh... Say, who's this girl? Uh, Mr. Baker, my name is... Can Ruth... you read? Oh, uh, of course I can read. Oh, do you read? Yeah, and I write, too. Oh, yeah. never mind our writing. Everybody writes in New York, even people who can't read. Here, come along with me. Uh, but, but, but where are we going? Uh... Mr. Craven, I want you to meet Miss, uh, what's your name? Sherwood, Ruth Sherwood from Columbus, Ohio. Miss Sherwood, meet Mr. Craven, owner of all the Craven publications. Oh, I'm very glad to know Miss you, Sherwood, Miss... in your time, you have read our magazine, The Manhattan. Is that true? Uh, yes. When was the last time? Oh, uh, years ago. Why? Well, uh, it, it just didn't interest oh, me. Oh, that's no answer. Can't you explain why, or don't you have any opinions about anything? I have opinions about a lot of things. Your magazine's 15 years behind the times, that's all. <laughs> Baker, you'll have to be a little smarter. Your guinea pig slams the Manhattan, but she'd like the, her material published in it. Just one minute. Get out. I certainly will. I've had a hard day, and I'm darn sick of your magazine. <laughs> Baker, if you ever break in here again with some ignorant college ignorant? girl... Why, if I tried for weeks, I couldn't give you a clearer, shrewder analysis of... Hey, 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 excuse me. Miss Williams, where's that... She's uh... gone, Mr. Baker, and she forgot to take a manuscript. Oh, is this it? Yes. Ah, Sherwood. Ruth Sherwood. 233 Barrow Street. <laughs> That's swell. Any luck today, Ruth? Terrific. What happened to you? Oh, I had the most exciting day. I was in the outer waiting room of Wallace Productions. Yeah? Did you get in? And I met a newspaper man, uh, uh, Mr. Clark, on the Globe. And what do you think, Ruth? He wants to interview me. But did you get in to see Mr. Wallace, dear? Well, uh, Mr. Clark thinks I should wait, and, oh, gee, I told him all about you, and he seemed very interested. <sighs> so interested in me, he can't wait to get you alone. Oh, don't be silly. He's going to speak to a city editor about you. Oh, that's fine. What have we got for dinner? Spaghetti and meatballs. Still? Haven't we polished that off yet? <laughs> well, it's only been four days. Say, Ruth, could you whip up a little dessert together? Oh, it's too hot. Let's skip dessert. Oh, but we can't, dear. There's a man coming for dinner. Who? What man? Oh, oh, didn't I tell you? Nope. Frank Lippincott, he manages the National Drugstore on, uh, on 44th Street. Oh, but why dinner here, dear? Well, darling, Frank's a very nice boy, and... And gee, besides, he never lets me pay my lunch checks. Eileen, why don't you wander into the Ritz? <laughs> oh, that must be Frank, and I have to fix my hair. Will you let him in, Ruth? And remember, he's a very nice boy, so please be careful. Well, who am I, Tugboat Annie? <laughs> Come in. Hello. Hello. Well, you're Mr. Lippincott, aren't you? I'm Eileen's sister. Oh, sure. I, I can see a family resemblance, all right. Oh, well, well, I'm very flattered. Of course, you're a different type. <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean, of course. <laughs> oh, hello, Frank. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Oh, that's that... all right. I, uh, I, I got a little gift here for you. Oh, a 
bottle of wine. Uh -huh. Oh, Frank, you shouldn't have done that. California Burgundy. It's a special we're running this week. So's our spaghetti. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> Hi there. Why, Chick. I, I mean, Mr. Clark. And... How you doing, Elnor? Warm, isn't it? Yeah, but you'll cool off. <laughs> and the name is Eileen. Uh, my name is Clark of the Globe. Uh, oh, who's it this is. gentleman here? I'd that like... uh, man there is Mr. Lippincott, and uh. he happens to be with the National Drug Store. <clears throat> I buy all my clothes there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Good no, heavens, what's that? Don't try to get away now. One move and I'll let you have it. Oh, lay off, you big ape. Let go, will you? Uh, my officer, what on earth... You... Oh, I found him in the alley with all them bedclothes. I think he's some kind of a fiend. Oh, no, he isn't. He just sleeps here. Sleeps here? Eileen, who is this man? Oh, I meant to tell you, Ruth. They call him the wreck. He's a football player, and he lives upstairs. Only and... my mother-in-law's coming tonight, see? Yeah, and, and she doesn't know she's his mother-in-law, and his wife was worried, so... Well, I just thought he could sleep in the kitchen. I warned you girls to move out of my beat. Wait a minute, officer. Who do you think you are? And who do you think you are? I'll tell you who I am. Stop I'm it, from stop the... Stop it, Nobody... Who, who knows who anybody is around here? Anybody walks in here. Everybody walks in who here. Who do you think, please? You see? What goes on? Oh, a cousin in full uniform. Who are you? I am Dorman at Rochamblini. This woman passed out. I bring her home. Wait a minute. Wait, who is she? Hey. It's Ella. Ella? Sure. She used to have this apartment. Psychic readings and seances. She said. Well, for a place with a bad location and no neon sign, we're doing a whale of a business. <laughs> Anybody home? Hey, who's this? Now, now who's that? Baker. Oh, good evening, Miss Sherwood. I, uh, I've read your material, and I'd like to discuss it. What? I said I've read your material. Yeah. That's what I thought you... you... Oh, Rose! Oh, oh, hey, quick, get some water, somebody. She's fainting. Yeah, and so ends Act One of My Sister Eileen, starring Brian Ahern, Rosalind Russell, George Tobias, and Janet Blair. Before we hear Act Two, a word from our hostess, Lady Esther. I once found a lovely, fragile painting in an antique shop, and I sent it to an art dealer to be restored. When I got it back, all its fragile beauty was gone, for the painting had been heavily coated with varnish. I thought of that ruined painting when I saw a lovely girl the other day. That is, a girl who could have been lovely if her face were not so thickly coated with makeup. Her skin had such an artificial, mask-like appearance that she looked... Well, she looked a little coarse, a little cheap. What a pity, I thought. She could look so wholesome and sweet. She could look so fine. If only she gave her skin a good, thorough cleaning. My fingers longed to rub Lady Esther for purpose face cream on her skin. Longed to wipe away all that stuff she had piled on her face, packing it down day after day into the tiny clogged pore openings. I could just imagine how wakened and alive her skin would look after a single Lady Esther creaming. A well, Lady Esther face cream gently removes embedded dirt that other methods often fail to remove. It cleans out the pore openings so thoroughly that they can return to normal again and the skin looks finer, more delicate. But cleaning the skin is only one of the four purposes of Lady Esther face cream. It also softens your skin, loosens and absorbs the dry little flakes that tend to make the skin look rough and bumpy. It makes your skin look younger and fresher by helping nature refine the pores. And it leaves such a smooth, perfect, non-sticky base for powder that women say the effect is enchanting. Because it does all these four important things, Lady Esther Face Cream can make even a dingy, long-neglected skin look immaculately clean and well cared for after just one or two applications. And the way to prove it is to try it. Just rub Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream on your skin. Wipe it off and see the clean, fresh texture of your skin revealed in all its beauty. And now the curtain rises on Act Two of My Sister Eileen, starring Rosalind Russell as Ruth Sherwood... Janet Blair as her sister Eileen, Brian Ahern as Mr. Baker, 
and George Tobias as Mr. Apopolis. Ruth continues our story. Painting? That wasn't exactly my style, you understand. Nor what followed, either. I mean, riding across town in a cab with Mr. Baker being so solicitous, promising such wonderful things. That's where we'll go to eat to the Napoli. Why, they make a dish over there that's fit for kings. Really? What? Spaghetti and meatballs. Oh. Oh, well, I thought so what? Anything for a career. And so we ate and we talked. That is, I ate and he talked. All about himself. His plans for the magazine. His work. And I kept thinking any minute now, he'll get to my stories, my work. And then quite suddenly it was 4 a.m. And we were standing out in front of my place. No, sir, I'm not going to quit. That's too easy. I'm going to stay and fight Craven to a finish. Find good authors. Help them to, to dig those stories out. Hey, what do you think? I think that's just fine, Mr. Baker. I also think it's 4 o'clock. And if I come across the kind of author you want, I'll let you know. Good night. Hey, wait a second. I won't even remind you that I'm an author and that I wrote some stories too, remember? About Columbus, Ohio. Sure, sure, and I read them. They're good. They are? Well, why didn't you say so? Didn't I? No. Well, as a matter of fact, those characters are really quite good. Oh, just quite good. You mean if you could publish them, you wouldn't? Well, the uh, the people come off, but the stories are flat. They, they, they don't get anywhere. Nothing happens. Ha-ha! That's because not enough happens to you. Oh, it doesn't, huh? That's what I said. Why, you can't lead a quiet, sheltered life. Quiet? Expect... Sheltered? Down in that tunnel? With subway blasts? And a populace cheating us blind with Eileen dragging home newspaper geniuses and drugstore managers and anything else she meets up with uptown? With football players drifting through and Cossacks bringing Ella home drunk? Not to mention the rest of the world looking in at the window for no good reason at all. Shut up, Oh, shut up yourself. Did you say sheltered, Mr. Baker? <laughs> this is what I mean. This is the stuff. Go on, write it. What do you mean? You mean write this? I mean exactly this. Go on, now, when can I have it? I, I don't know. I'll go right to work in the morning. <laughs> if those wolves will let me live through the night. <laughs> Say, Ruth, was anyone here today? Not a soul. What happened to you? I was at the food show. Yeah, what are they casting at the food show? Well, I saw people come out with big bags of samples, and I thought we might as well have some, too. We've got enough junk here for a week. Look. Vita kernels. Ruffo. Grano. Nature's broom. <laughs> We're going to have breakfast all day long. Oh, but it's good for you. It's roughage. I'd like to vary it with a little smoothage, like a steak. <laughs> oh, gee, Ruth, what's the matter? You seem terribly down. Oh, it's my story, I guess. It's been in for a week. I haven't heard a word from Mr. Baker. Oh, gimme, gimme. Hello? Yes, this is she, her, she. <laughs> oh, yes, Mr. Baines. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yes, yes, I've got it. Sand Street, Brooklyn. Yeah, right away, Mr. Baines. Goodbye. Gee, I can't believe it. Your story? No, that was Chick Clark's paper. He's given me a chance to show what I can do. An assignment over in Brooklyn. Brooklyn? What happened there? A Portuguese ship, Merchant Marine, with a load of young cadets. They want a human interest story. Say, uh, say, where is Brooklyn? Well, I don't know, but you can't miss it. That's a help. <laughs> really shouldn't have just walked in here like this. Why not, sugar? Back door was open. Oh, well, I think you'd better go now. What? After I fixed it to get you alone? Without that, uh, what do you call it, eagle-eyed sister of yours around? You fixed it? Then it wasn't the editor. You set Ruth on that wild goose chase. Wild goose nothing. It's darn good experience. <laughs> come on, sugar. Stop playing coy, will you? Oh, stop. Oh, come here. on, get Stop over it, a little closer. With... Hey. Oh, Ruth. Hey, she's back with a lot of sailors. Excuse me, sugar, I got a date in the Bronx. Eileen, I... Ah, oh, 
outside door began now. What is it? The fleet's in, darling. Oh, yes, Scott, Portuguese. They've been on my tail ever since I, I left the dock. Stop. Well, what'd you bring them here for? Because I don't know the Portuguese for scram. Well, don't they understand any English at all? Not a word. Well, it's a mesmobilissima. And I don't need Portuguese to get the idea. Now, listen, boys, listen. Now, be good boys and go back to your boat. You know, boat. Huh? See, I salute <laughs> Admiral Sherwood, I presume. Ruth, look, they're tossing a coin. What are they tossing for? I got a hunch it's not me. Earthquake, earthquake, run for your lives. Everybody out, front door, back door, run. No, no. Great performance, Eileen. Bernhardt couldn't have done it better. Say, you stay away from that radio. That's not just a toy dog. Here come they down. come, Eileen. Oh, no, you don't. You keep your hands off me. Let go. Eileen, they just want to dance. The conga, you know. Lead them out the back door. Run like mad for the front and I'll slip you in. Go on. All right, boys. The conga. Here we go, boys. Out the back door. <sighs> Saved by the bell. Young lady, I won't have it. You cannot make a circus here. Now, Mr. Apopolis, look, this is all in fun. You realize that. There isn't anything to get excited about if you'll just keep calm about the entire thing. I yeah. can explain everything yeah. if, you, if you'll really be reasonable. This is a riot. I have called the police. Oh, no, you didn't. And tomorrow when your month is up, you go out. Oh, very well, then. We're still dissatisfied, and you can just return our month's rent. What are you talking about? What you promised us. I promised that? Nonsense. I was one of the witnesses, and I don't remember. Now, look here, Mr. Witness. <laughs> Just look here. Oh, my gosh! The police! Ruth! Ruth, it's a riot. They've got the squad car. Start packing, Eileen. I guess we're licked. Oh. Oh, hello, Sherwood. Mr. Oh. Baker. Uh, am I interrupting anything? No, no, not a thing. We're just going to pack. Pack? What for? We're going home. Yes, uh, father phoned us. He, uh, he wants us with him. You know, he's lonely. Well, you're coming back, of course. Oh, oh very soon. That's not so. Oh. We're never coming back. We're going home because we're a couple of flat, broke failures. Oh, Ruth. Now, just a minute, Miss Sherwood. You're not a failure, and you're not flat broke. Why, I've got a check here with your name on it for $250. 250 What for? See this issue of the Manhattan? Page 15. Page 15? What's hot? Wait a minute, Ruth. I've got it. I, I mean, I'm getting it. Here, here, page 15. <gasps> Look! My sister Eileen by Ruth Sherwood. What? <gasps> I'm famous. And I'm rich. Oh, now we can move to a decent joint. Miss Sherwood, is that nice to say? Would you leave me now when I have such plans? What plans, Mr. Apopolis? New furniture, new paint, A1 stoves and plumbing, Venetian blinds, and considering a six-month lease on a very friendly basis... The rent reduced to $30 a month. $30 a month, huh? Well, that's very reasonable. But, Ruth, now the subway blasting. Oh, that's all over. I have it here in black and white. The blasting stops September 1st, today. Well, if the blasting stops... All right. It's a deal. Oh, what's that? The blasting is over. Now the drilling starts. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Russell, Miss Blair, Mr. Ahern, and Mr. Tobias for bringing us the story of my sister Eileen. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players are grateful that you could be our guests tonight. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. We are all aware of what fine work is being done by the Motion Picture Relief Fund and Clinic. And to know that the benefits from this program support that work makes our annual appearance with the Lady Esther Screen Guild players a real pleasure. We'll be back soon. And now, before we tell you about next week's program, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Russell. Ladies, have you ever asked yourself, what does the face cream I use really do for my skin? 
Does it make my skin look any fresher or more attractive? Does it make my skin feel any softer or smoother? Well, you can tell soon enough by touching your skin with your fingertips, by examining it in your mirror. And if you have any rough spots here and there, if you have any blackheads, any big pore openings, any lines due to dryness around your eyes and mouth, well, it's time to make a change. Now, I'd like you to try Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream against any other cream on the market, even the most expensive cream. I'd like you to put it to the most severe test possible. Use it when your skin is its dirtiest and most neglected, when it's dingy to look at and feels rough and bumpy to your fingers. You see, Lady Esther Face Cream does these four important things for the beauty of your skin. It thoroughly cleans your skin. It softens your skin. It helps nature refine the pores, and it leaves a perfect non-sticky base for powder. Just try Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream and see how much more youthful and enchanting your skin looks in almost no time at all. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present a great and thrilling story of the present war, Edge of Darkness. It will star Ralph Morgan, Maureen O'Hara, and John Garfield. Be sure to listen. Rosalind Russell and Brian Ahern are currently working in 10% Woman. Janet Blair is now working in Curly, both Columbia productions. George Tobias can now be seen in the Warner Brothers picture... Thank your lucky stars. The music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. For economy's sake, get the largest size jar of Lady Esther four-purpose face cream and the larger size of Lady Esther face powder. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther, saying thank you. And good night, all. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.